You're listening to Power Athlete Radio, a podcast dedicated to empowering your performance every damn day. Join former NFL pro and power athlete founder John Wellborn as he dissects the greatest minds in strength, conditioning, and more. So whether your goal is to be the hammer, destroy mediocrity, or simply move the dirt, you've come to the right place. Now with the warm-up done, let the gains begin. Power Athlete Radio listeners, we have a strong guest for you today, Josh Bryant. Josh is an author, coach, and strength athlete who holds world records in powerlifting and won the strongest man in America in 2005. Via the interwebs, he's referred to as the trainer of superstars because he works with some of the strongest and most muscular athletes in the world. He counts Metroflex Gym in Arlington, Texas as his home base and patrols the internet from his Instagram account, Jailhouse Strong, all the while staying gas station ready. Buckle up for Josh Bryant. Uh, there was an old power lifter that trained me in high school, a guy named George Zangus, that owned Marathon Nutrition, who invented the super suits and the wraps. Yeah, so, I know who that is. Yeah, yeah. So, so mm-hmm. I was 14 years old. George lived in our in our uh, in in our town, and I ended up meeting him through his godson's older brother, who I played football with. This guy named Tasso Papadakis. You know, there's a big Greek contingent. And uh, Tosso and I became friends, and he's like, hey, you got to meet, you know, Uncle George. So 14 years old, we go over, and I start training in Zangus's garage. And, That's uh, you know, he had, uh, you know, reverse hyper. I mean, it was uh, really classic powerlifting stuff, you know, suits and wraps, and we were fucking suiting up and wrapping way too early. I mean, I could barely squat 225 when I was putting fucking wraps on my knees, which I think well, he, 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 was, he was like more the founder of equipment, so that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so he... At a, I remember I was probably like 16 and I remember we were benching and he started talking to me about compensatory acceleration and he mentioned Fred Hatfield and Dr. Squad and, uh, um, you know, how he had known, uh, oh. Fred and, and it really just, it, it was, it was really interesting cause he painted this picture that he and Fred were like great friends and he was this amazing dude. And, uh, uh, so I kind of always grew up, you know, hearing about Fred Hatfield, Dr. Squat and compensatory acceleration. And what we talked about in that garage, I believe is probably the single greatest principle or training tip or whatever you want to call it that I think sure. al- allowed me to go play in the NFL. I mean, hands down, you know, the yeah, idea. I, heard, I, I, remember, I don't remember who you were talking to, but it wasn't even the Fred one. I heard you talking about that with somebody else. Yeah. I mean, as mechanical advantage increases, so does speed. Right. So as like, you know, most people were just trying to place their hands. I was trying to like put my hands through people. And, you know, this idea that like as mechanical advantage increases, I'm going to be able to extend and punch my hands through individuals. And then I took it into hitting where if I was going to go hit somebody, I wasn't just trying to hit them. I was trying to put my head through them or my hands through them. And, the, and that piece of compensatory acceleration, right. like from squatting, from jumping, like it just was one of those things that I was like an aha moment for me at like 16 years old that just clicked. And I just ported that over into everything. And then people were like, man, how do you punch so hard? How are you hitting so hard? And I was, and even to the point where uh, I was pretty young. I mean, I bet you it was maybe at least 14 or 15. I remember George said, don't lift weights like old people have sex, slow and careful. I want you to be violent with the weights. I want you to try to fucking hurt them. I, w- I want you to lift weights in yeah, such a way awesome. that if people that don't know you come, I want them to come over and be like, dude, you're going to hurt yourself. What are you doing? Like, I want you to break these motherfuckers. And so like, that was like these little, you know, interesting tidbits of knowledge that, you know, I was kind of mentored with, you know, from like 14 to 18, uh, ended up kind of setting a certain tone for me, you know, that allowed me to go and be successful in the NFL. So years later, when I retired and CrossFit started working with me and, and I kind of started traveling and teaching for them and really just working through our technology, um, I had just mm. an interesting moment, a realization where we went to a seminar and a bunch of people came to train with us and everybody was pretty strong, but they were just really slow. And I realized that I hadn't talked about compensatory acceleration enough and I hadn't like made it like a cornerstone where I used to mention it to people, but I didn't like start jamming it down their throat that the, the, the way that I should have. Right. So I, I reached out to Fred and we got on the call and I, I explained to him like where I'd first heard it and my relationship with Angus. And I realized at that moment, like as soon as I heard him talking that I was like, oh, there was bad blood between these guys because, uh, He's like, first of all, those fucking raps tore me up. That suit tore me up. George still fucking owes me money. I did this. And like, there was like a lot of like 
I, I could tell. And I was like, oh, oh, yeah, he was pretty salty at him over some shit that had happened, you know, 30, 40 years ago, let's say, you know. And uh, I was like, and he's like, wait a minute. He said what? And I was like, dude, he spoke of you very highly and talked about you as a good friend of his constantly. And like, it was like he like took like a deep breath and I could tell he was smoking a cigarette because he like, like took a long <laughs> inhale. And yeah. uh, and he's like, hmm, maybe I was wrong. I should have called him. And then uh, at that point, he's like, you know, I should call him. And I was like, well, he's dead. He, he passed away. And uh, he was like, oh, shit. I hadn't spoken to him in this. And so it was like, uh, like maybe it was a miscommunication or maybe time knocks the edges off of a lot of shit. Like I sometimes think, you know, with, um, I'm sure you've seen this, like I have, you know, like things happen in the past and over time they either get sharper or they, or the edges get knocked off for me. Like edges get knocked off on stuff where even though I was pissed, I'm like, ah, I'm not as mad as I was. And then other things are just like the knife is still sharp, if not sharper, where if I see for somebody, sure. I want to fucking smash their face 20 years later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, um, so then I kind of created a interesting friendship with Fred and I'd reach out to him and he'd send me information and this, and, uh, I had gone out and, you know, Louis Simmons had reached out to me and I went out there for a little bit and, you know, he and he and Louis had kind of a tumultuous kind of relationship, I'm sure as you know, but you mm-hmm. know, I mean, both had interesting impacts, you know, amazing impacts, but then we had Fred on the podcast and he is such a, he was such a showman. It was like he, you know, talked about his speeches and this. I mean, it was great. And then um, when he was coming to town, I remember he reached out and he was like, hey, you know, do you guys want to get together? I'm like, man, I'd love to come and just record something. And this is kind of like pre-podcast, you know, now people do them in person. But I just thought it'd been fun to go down and just just rap with him about a bunch of stuff. And when I showed up, I, I could tell he wasn't <laughs> he wasn't as healthy as uh um, it was kind of like we went and did like, I, I feel like the Grim Reaper now, but we went and did a podcast with Louis Simmons right before he passed away as well. And when he showed up, I knew like Louis's time was close. Fred, I didn't get that as much, but um, I knew he was kind of coming to the end of his stuff. But I went to your seminar and he was- Fred was a surprise. Yeah. Fred was definitely a surprise. That was not one you saw coming for sure. Because like, if anything, he had more pep in his step then than he did when I first- um, start doing stuff with him it's kind of like when we started doing seminars and stuff he kind of got revived he was like he was like on fire ready to do some more courses for issa and like you know i think it w- wasn't foreseen because you know in 2012 he was given like a week to live yeah with yep. lung cancer yeah and then like um did he hooked up with uh, i forget the guy's name that re- keto researcher um yeah dom digo dom diagostino yeah, yeah told him to try this, you know, what he got to lose kind of thing. And he did and, and was better and kind of, um, was still real low energy. Then as time went on, he really got higher energy, but I mean, maybe he's just almost doing too much at the end. I don't know. He was, um, I mean, like when we were to Japan, he would try to walk like some of the things you have to walk four miles or something, 75 years old. And he, he would, he would attempt it, you know? Yeah. No, he, um, yeah, he uh, like not, not only just like an amazing dude, but um, you know, just kind of a badass at the very uh-huh. end. Like we went and did that event, and I think he passed away shortly thereafter. And I think it was what it was a heart attack. I honestly, I'm I I never asked the details. I, I don't even and you know, I I talked to his wife and stuff. I, I've never have asked. I, I think so. Yeah, I you I, know I, I don't honestly know. Yeah, uh, it was it was uh, I, I was kind of making fun of him because he was vaping. And he's like, oh, it's way better than the cigarettes. And I'm like, oh, I don't know. But uh, we'll I'll figure that piece out. But yeah, he was uh, such an interesting cat, man. I, um, you know, reading power and just his contribution. But uh, I felt so indebted to him um, because of that, you know, compensatory acceleration. And I know you talk about it extensively as well. Uh, and what's what blows yeah. what blows my mind is um, I've heard you talk about it and I've heard us talk about it. And I've heard very few other people talk about it. And Not many it, others. And it's one of those things where like I look around and I'm like, this is something that you can add to your training that like doesn't require any modification, like no special equipment. It just talks about like understanding it and intent. Yeah. And no, no money. No. It, yeah. It's it's like bolting a turbo on, on, on your car. It's like free horsepower. You know, it's going to run off exhaust anyway. Um, it's, that's the example I get. I don't know if you're a car guy, but, um, I'm into trucks and build, yeah, build crazy definitely. shit and weld and, you know, do a bunch of wild stuff. But like, I love turbos for the fact it's free horsepower. Bolt this sucker on exhaust runs it and it allows me to get more horsepower, more torque. Um, that, that was compensatory acceleration. 
And the interesting piece is I think people use uh, accommodating resistance with chains and bands to try to get the same effect. And I think that there is a moment for it, but um, to be able to do it without the accommodating resistance, where now I'm just trying to smash these motherfuckers. Um, the carryover that I saw to sport and to playing football and offensive line and all the things that I did um, was just like I couldn't count it and I couldn't thank him enough for putting that information out there and just happening to be in an old power lifters garage, him talking about fucking break these motherfuckers. I want you to be violent with these weights. I want them to remember your name and me using that mode of thinking every time I go into the gym um, was extremely thankful or impactful. And I was so thankful to him. And I think that was when I got on, I was like, ah, like, I don't know more, why more people aren't talking about this. Like, why isn't this, a standard training method for performance well, I based think athletes. Part of it's probably don't you th like you just said, it doesn't require special equipment. You don't have to buy anything. It's it's not really gonna make money as much for you know people, I guess that would be kind of shouting it from the rooftops. I mean, where where do you go from there? Because you've given somebody this way to enhance everything and it doesn't really financially benefit you as much as like if you came out with some crazy like get you know, gadget or something. So I think that's part of it. And it's also just not that exciting after a while for people like on Instagram and stuff to be like, Hey, look, <laughs> look at my deadlift speed right here. You know, like that there's those, that component too. So I mean, it's financial and I think it's entertainment. Yeah. Or lack of. Uh, yeah. It's, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll basically always call well, it. He, a, you know what Fred said to me, he said, he, he said to me that, um, he thought the difference between the strongest people in the world and the people that are kind of strong, you know, is basically compensatory acceleration, like the stronger people, they may not even be able to express it in words like we are here, but they intuitively get it and do it. Mm -hmm. And that's what he thinks kind of separates, you know, from like that top 20% to that top 1% a lot of times. Well, I mean, think about the bench press. I mean, where do most people miss on the bench? It's really at the bottom. You know, you see people kind of bring right. the bar yeah, down and they, right. yeah, it, it's always like four to six inches off the chest. And, you know, uh, Louie and, you know, the power lifters are like, oh, it's tricep and this. And I'm like, maybe it's the fact that as the bar slows down, they don't have the strength to overcome, like, the lack, you know, the inertia, the slowing down. So, like, why not just as you're training, work on accelerating the bar through? I mean, um, I, I know you benched as I was going through your stuff. Right. I mean, 600 plus pounds. Which I think, well, I think with Louis, there's, there's the aspect of shirted training too. Yeah. So that's, a, that's going to train, that's going to change a lot of people. I've had this debate with people. I think it changes the strength curve of the lift because the shirt basically lifts it off the bottom for you, but then you're on your own at the triceps. So it's totally, it's a different lift in a lot of ways when you add a shirt because, because of that. So obviously with it, you know, if you're benching 900 in a shirt, you do 500 without it. You better damn sure make you got strong triceps. You're going to get hurt or well, not lift the weight. We interrupt this episode with a shameless self-promotion. Do you want to build thick sidewalk splitting slabs of muscle? Let me introduce you to Jack Street. Get access to the same tried and true training methods I followed during my 10 years in the NFL. All to walk into training camp at 308 pounds at sub 8% body fat. Punch your ticket to the game train and join thousands of residents already following Jack Street. Head to powerathletehq.com forward slash Jack Street and claim your seven-day free trial today. Now back to the show. Well, when I was out at Westside, we were doing floor presses, and I think I floor pressed 500, and A.J. Roberts floor pressed like 505 or 502 and a half or something. Threw on his shirt a couple days later and benched 940. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, so, but, but the other thing too, is even the technique in the shirt's different, you know, like on a natural bench, there's kind of this natural, almost like C, like you bring it down and they kind of drive it back into your delt a little bit where those guys are bringing the bar down kind of that belly up and they're driving it away almost in like a straight line, if not pushing it away from them to try to get into this position. Technique and leverage, you know, de definitely with the, the shirt with a, a raw bench press for the most part is going to be a little more, you know, power and speed because you um i mean there's like you, you there's a lot of people that don't even have great technique quote unquote in bench pressing that still lift huge weights raw because of that they have the they have the musculature they have the strength they have the power where in a shirt if you're like you know one inch out of your groove you can go from like say an example you did 940 you do that easily you get one inch off the groove 950 is gonna like you know break you in half or that doesn't happen as much raw for yeah, sure sure i mean you get one inch out of that you know sort of straight line with a shirt you're screwed yeah no, I mean the um, like I I always thought that 
with the shirt and like the way that Louis was teaching it with the accommodating resistance was trying to change the strength curve because the shirt had the most energy at the bottom. So they didn't have to be strong off the chest. But even you think about raw benchers, most raw benchers are pretty strong off the chest. It, like I never watch anybody bring it down and not get it off their chest. It's always like right. two to four, six inches up and they just can't, you know, and is that a tricep issue or the fact that they're not using compensatory acceleration. So they're used to like driving hard. Yeah. I think it's sort of like a hundred meters or something like at the end of that race, it's speed endurance, like how much you can hold on to that speed, you know, that speed you developed. And I think a lot of that's the same with, with bench pressing. Like, you know, you said you get that compensatory acceleration training. How long can you maintain that and, and get and just blow past those supposed sticking points? They're not there if it's fast enough. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, uh, you know, a big thing that I was um, kind of the splinter in my mind, my, my matrix moment was mm -hmm. um, everything that I did in the weight room, I was able to translate onto the field. So I, I played with a lot of guys that were super strong. You know, you watch a guy bench, you know, 585 for a, you know, a pause single. And you're like, Jesus Christ, that guy's fucking strong. You go out on the field and it's like, I didn't right. feel any of that strength out there. So there was always this weird, uh, I don't know, almost like disconnect where I'd see what people would do in the weight room. And I'd even watch guys that could barely bench 225 go out there and just stone fools. And this was this constant splinter in the mind. Like how come some people can apply more and others can't? And one of the things that as I got stronger using compensatory acceleration, especially in my punch and hitting, uh, I felt that like for every pound I gained in the weight room, it was two pounds on the field. And, you know, even when I'd watch guys just kind of place their hands, like my ability to accelerate through and try to push my hands through an individual and the idea of mechanical advantage increases. So does speed. Um, fuck dude. Like to the point where like people didn't want to play against you. People didn't want to do drills or didn't want to hit with you. Cause they were like, dude, I feel like you're fucking breaking me inside. And I'm like, dude, I'm, I, I got heavy hands yeah. or it's just the fact that I know how to accelerate my hands when you guys don't like other people were just kind of placing them there. I was trying to so use So when you were things. in there, were you, were you able to do, were you kind of doing your own program? Yeah. Were yeah. you doing like teams programs when you were in there or are you kind of able to do your own thing? Um, so when I left, uh, I never trained with the team in the off season. They would never give me an off season workout deal. Um, so I remember telling them like, if you don't give me an off season workout deal, I'm not, not going to train here. So I went down to Florida and trained with a guy with named, uh, Rafael Ruiz. And, um, every year I came back, okay. they were, they were like, Oh, so-and-so made hundred percent of his training. You didn't make any. And I'd always be like, great, let's line up and do the conditioning tests. Let's run, let's do all the testing. And I would always fucking smash everything. I'd finish number one <laughs> of the conditioning. Yeah. You know, I had uh 10, den 10 dead hang pull-ups with 90 pounds between my waist. Um, you know, I benched 535 for a triple, you know, like a fast triple. I mean, everything that came in, I remember being like, dude, I was the only guy over 300 pounds that ever tested under 10% bod pat, uh, under 10% body fat in the bod pod. I was 308 at like 8%, like 282 pounds of mm -hmm. lean muscle. So, I mean, I, I fucking smashed everything and I was like, okay, like, let's go. I'm going to be the starter here day one. Like, what are we worried about? Um, I just, it wasn't, that I didn't want to train with the team, but like, if they're not going to pay me, I'm going to go train where, where I want and with the best guy who I thought at the world for me was uh, Raphael. Yeah. What was the conditioning test back then? Uh, 16 half gassers, mm -hmm. which is, you know, I mean, uh, like it's, it's just hard enough to where if you don't condition or, you know, if you haven't been doing it, you can maybe pass it. But, you know, I mean, for me, uh, I've, I was always a big believer, uh, like I always wanted to be in shape whether it be for vanity or for whatever reason, I didn't like to feel gas and I don't like to feel tired. Um, I want right. to, you know, like if, if I'm on the field and you know, the quarter ends and you know, you, you know, obviously you change sides, like the minute the quarter would end, I would just take off sprinting and running. Cause I wanted that dude to think that I was still fresh. So I just always put a huge premium on being in shape and being in condition. And then the other one that constantly scared me, um, and I'm sure you've seen this is when dudes get out of shape is when they get hurt. Oh, for sure. So, you know, a guy like gets injured, isn't in shape, isn't playing back, comes back. And I just think that if you show up out of shape and, you know, I'm sure banging heavy weights and the stuff you do, um, you know, you, you have to be heavy, uh, in good enough shape to be able to survive the training, which was kind of my mantra. And recover from it for sure. Yep. So I just didn't like to be out of shape, dude. Cause, uh, I, I like injuries happened and like, there's nothing worse than knowing that you could have done more. And, and if you had, you wouldn't have been in this situation. 
And like, that was a big thing for me. I mean, and I know you're going to laugh, but you know, undersized at six, five, 300 pounds, which people still laugh to this day, but like these dudes are way bigger than me. And I knew that like consistent effort. And if I can come off and give them 70 plays at 90%, it's better than like one or two at a hundred and a bunch at 40 or 50. And, you know, so that like consistent effort, which was what allowed me to play for a decade. Power the nation. This episode is brought to you by eight sleep summer's in full effect. And it is hot here in Texas. And when I say hot, I mean, hot, hot. And the best way to sleep is at 55 degrees with the eight sleep pod cover. This thing allows the bed to get icy and there's nothing better on a hot night than slipping into an icy cold bed. Now, there's a few features of this thing that are absolute game changers. One, it's a pod cover, so it fits on top of your present mattress. Anybody that's been in the market and had to go out and shop for a new mattress, complete pain in the ass because you usually have a significant other or a friend or whoever sleeps with you that decides, hey, this is the temperature I like. I like firmer. I like softer. So you can keep your mattress. It's a pod cover that fits on top. Also, it's split zone. So let's say I like to sleep at 55 degrees and my wife likes to sleep at 65. We can have separate temperatures, which just makes everybody happy. And then also for the performance crowd, which I'm kind of a geek, I like to know all of the different sleep metrics out there. It gives me how long I slept, how restful, how many breaths, and most importantly, my HRV, which I can track. So it allows me to know how restful and how well I sleep. It also has some custom tuning with different temperatures that gets really deep in the weeds with this thing. It's as good a system as I've ever seen. So if you're interested in checking out the 8sleep pod cover, you can use the code 8sleep.com slash power athlete for $150 off. I recommend you check it out. I'm not only telling you about it, I'm also a user every single night and I'm sold on 8sleep. Check it out. Yeah, I think a lot, I think it's a good point you touch on. I think what you call is a lot of people and a lot of things that create an artificial strength base where all they do is strength training and you would be strong for one or two, two plays, but it's an artificial base because as soon as you start conditioning and things, you're going to drop off versus maintain good conditioning at least. And then there's not going to be that drop off and you're going to be ready for anything at any time kind of thing. And then, you know, when you have to focus on something specifically, you can really focus on that, but you always have that conditioning base. And uh, I, I always like to run. I, I, I'd like to me, uh, sprinting and running fast um, was like the greatest flex. I just like I liked lifting heavy weights, going out and sprinting and being fast. Like though, like there are certain things that uh, just inherently, like through whether it be ego or whatnot, like those were things that I was like, "Yo, man, I can run fast, and I'm big, yeah, I'm, sure. I'm big and strong, and I want to be able to run and jump." And, uh, you know, whether it be a little bit of vanity or whatnot, but like, there are certain things that I was like, you know what, like if we got a sprint, I want to be able to run and I want to be able to change direction. I want to be real strong. Why don't we go lift weights and I want to be able to throw shit. So, um, you know, whereas a lot of guys, uh, looked at like lifting weights and training in the NFL is, uh, you know, they require us to do this. We have to do this. Whereas I looked at it like, man, like this is my opportunity to go in and sharpen my blade every time I go in the weight room. So. Um, even in the off season or e even during season, uh, like my heaviest upper body day was on Friday, uh, with a Sunday game, we'd go in there. Wow. And so like, I, I had this deal where, uh, season or first week of the season, I would try to, I mean, I would, it, there had to be a minimum of four or five, like I would, I would work up to four or five and I do it for max reps every Friday. And if I got 10 on week one, as long as I got at okay. least a single in week 17, I was happy. And it was some like auto regulation. Yeah. So I'd go for max reps and there had to at least go four or five on the bar every Friday. And it was usually Friday by the time my hands and everything felt better. But like I, you know, and I remember there were times where like I only got it for one and I was like, at least I got one. But I knew yeah, that like, sure. as long as that like heavy weights required me to keep the nervous system firing, I knew as long as I put those in. So it was kind of, um, uh, very different than how most people trained. But uh, the strength coaches were real yeah. good in that they're like, yo, you're real strong. Like, I think you know what you're doing. You just tell us what you want to do. So, and in hindsight, I wish I had had it like for the fact that the internet exists and all these others, I probably would have reached out to other people to get their uh, advice. But, you know, you remember the days you actually had to physically call people on the phone and talk to them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, for sure. You know, there was no podcast. There was no internet forums. There was nothing like to pick up the phone. I, I still, I've told the story on the podcast of, um, I, had, I ruptured my patellar tendon my rookie year and my knee wasn't improving. And I, I had been working with Mario De Pasquale 
Um, I got hooked up through with his supplement company and he was doing my diet and he put me in touch with Charlie Francis and I had to pick mm. up and call Charlie on the phone who was also smoking cigarettes, which was funny. And he wrote me out like an EMS protocols. So, okay. Get a pen and paper. And then like showed me where to get the EMS device. And I ended up using the EMS to help fix my patellar tendon and get my muscle to fire. But I mean, he was on a speaker yeah. phone, you know, that's pretty cool. Yeah. So it was neat in that way. So I've been real fortunate, like, you know, obviously connecting with Fred, but it was such a, it was such an interesting moment when I first got him on the phone and I realized that he and Zangus had had kind of a tumultuous relationship. <laughs> I was like, I was like, fuck, I, uh, he had talked about you for years. I thought you guys were great friends. And he's like, that motherfucker still owes me money. I'm like, oh shit. Well, he's dead now. There's no way to collect on it. So we'll just let it go. Yeah. He, I never, he never brought him up to me. I mean, I know who that is, but he, I don't, he never brought him. Where, where was, where were you based out of then? Um, where was New York or something? No, uh, Southern California. So, okay. uh, Palos Verdes, Torrance area. And so George, okay, uh, yeah. So I grew up in PV and George lived what there. What high school did you go to? Uh, I, I first went to Peninsula or Palos Verdes high school and then they closed it. And then I went to Peninsula high school, which was like the culmination of all the high schools. So, okay. Are you familiar with that area? Yeah. I, I grew up in California. I moved out here when I was like, oh, so early twenties, mid twenties. And, um, we played uh, Santa Barbara. We played, um, Carson down there. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. We, we played, uh, you know, Carson, Inglewood, Morningside, all of those schools. So that was all within that kind of Torrance, you know, Palos Verde CIF deal. Yeah. 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 And then what, cool. then, then you moved out from what Santa Barbara area and moved to Dallas, to Nashville, Tennessee. Then I moved from Nashville to, um, to Dallas area and then I've been here ever since. Every time I drive to Dallas, I'm like, I don't think I could live in Dallas. At least this area we are in Austin Hill Country kind of reminds me of like Central California. But when I drive to Dallas, it reminds me of the fucking 909 out in the uh, Inland Empire. That's funny. Which part do you go to? Because I'm, I'm in South Lake, though. It, is it nicer out there? I mean, I do. Do you uh, Yeah, kind of. I'm, I'm not as familiar yeah. with it. You know, when we would fly in, you know, obviously to play uh, Dallas and a little bit I've seen. But... Okay. Not too far from the airport. Okay. You think it's, it's, it's west of the airport? It's pretty nice. Yeah, it's like the it's the number one school district in Texas. It's like it's it's like way more greenery and trees and stuff like that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, Texas is. Uh, I'm sure you're catching a little bit of this heat, but um, uh, up in my building where the gym is, it was 111 yesterday, and uh, dude, it was oh, like sure. there was no hiding from it. So where do you, where are you at in Austin then? Um, do, you're obviously familiar with the area. To a point. Yeah, so we're west of Austin in a, in a town called Bee Cave out near Hamilton Pool. Off like 71 Hamilton Pool area. Called what now? I just got out there. What'd you say? What's uh, it called? Uh, the little town we're near is called Bee Cave. Like Dripping Springs, Bee Cave. It's all west Austin. Oh, I know where Dripping Springs is. Okay. Yeah, so we're out towards there. Um, have you ever heard of the Hamilton Pools? mm So uh, this old farmer had like a few thousand acres and some high school kids found this basically like rock uh waterfall with this like natural spring pool that was pretty famous and um they ended up donating it to the you know to the to the county and now it's like a kind of an attraction like a big swim deal but it's it's pretty wow. it's pretty fucking amazing when i came out here my agent was from this area um so my rookie year in the nfl we came out here and we went out there and i showed up and it was like 400 people at the crazy speech party i've ever seen they're like floating kegs and people jumping off of the top and then the next time I went back, they had actually donated it to, wow. the, to the county. And of course, then it was like you had to buy tickets and, you know, you couldn't do any of that stuff. But yeah. It's so crazy. these people just donated to the county? Yeah. So this guy had a huge property out here and didn't even know it existed. And I guess these local kids, you know, kids being kids and just, know, you know, I mean, I'm sure you did too. And we, we used to ride our bikes around. We knew more about shit than anybody. And they, yeah, for sure. And they had found this. And would just go out there as a swimming hole, and then their friends came, and it was just kind of this urban legend. And then at some point, the uh, cool. the people just donated the land to the county for them to take care of it. Now there's like a guard booth, and you have to buy tickets, and they test the water. So there's only certain times you can go in when the, I think like the, what is it like? They have some like bacteria overgrowth. I mean, it's all it's it's pretty funny. They 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 only open it. It's pretty rare. So I know we always kind of apply for tickets, but yeah, they're they're right down the road from us. Is it pretty rural out where you're at? It was. Uh, when we moved out here, it was like the country. And then okay. uh, COVID happens and Joe Rogan moves to Austin and starts talking about how great it is on his podcast. And all of a sudden, like, it exploded. Really? Like, it was wow. – like, like we, we lived in the country. 
Like it was uh, like the first year I was there, um, I like set up our deer stands. I mean, I used to hunt out of my backyard. I still do. But um, like we couldn't see any neighbors. And then uh, all of a sudden, like there was a development that I could see three roofs. Now there's like hundreds of roofs. And then they built about 3,000 homes just up the road from us. So, I mean, it, it like mm. in, we, Wait, is it, we get a lot of, pig, do you get a lot of pigs down there? Uh, we did when I first moved in, I shot a pig. So I, I set up cams and I have thermals and, uh, yeah, I, too. Yeah, I dude, I had a pig. I mean, we, we were overrun. I shot a pig probably every three days for six months. That's awesome. To, to the point where, uh, I would shoot them and then just go back to bed and go get them in the morning. When I first started shooting them, I was all excited. I go out there, like take a selfie <laughs> And then drag them out. And uh, I got to the point where I would just shoot them. And then my wife would be like, hey, you going to get rid of that pig? And I'd like look out there and you'd see buzzards. And I'd be like, gosh, shit, let me go get rid of them. I just got to the point where I was so uh, just so mad at what they were doing because, um, you know, they were basically digging up. Like we have um, the property we're on was originally the guy had horses. So it's all got it's it's got horse pastures and my neighbor has a horse riding school. So she's got 60 horses. So she turns all of her horses out in her pastures. So the pigs would come through looking for acorns underneath the oak trees and they would just dig everything up. So there were these huge kind of just holes in the ground. And so I I would have to go out and just basically fill the holes because I was worried about the horses getting hurt. And uh, after you've, you know, filled like your 400th hole, I'm like, dude, I'm going to fucking kill these things just with like gross prejudice. So it was like, you know, 300, 308, 300 blackout, like just looking for whatever round I have, um, a UMP 45, uh, that's suppressed with, uh, for, you know, shoot 45s at them with a laser. So I was just lobbing 45s at them. I've killed these things with, uh, with sh- shotgun slugs. Like I'd be like, how am I going to kill them today? I've shot them with just about everything just because out, out of, out of more <laughs> anger awesome. than anything, like doing like yeah. a, you know, 30 round mag dump, uh, with 45 on these things just to try to light them up. So cool. I have a, I'm sure like you do, I have a gross hatred of feral pigs. I got a love and a hatred. I, I think it's fun to hunt them. So I kind of, I kind of want them to come in, but <laughs> I didn't, cause we have a property in Alvord. You know where that is? Like that's uh-huh. like by Decatur. It's about an hour from here. Okay. I like when they, come, I mean, we don't have that kind of stuff though, horse pastures and stuff. So I kind of like when they come in, wait up from at night and get them with a the thermal. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, there's some dudes that are, um, I follow on Instagram um, God, I can't remember. It's like, uh, boar hunting in Texas and they're always post these huge monsters, you know, and they'll, they'll have these just monster pigs. And it's pretty funny. I think what they do is they end up uh, oh, yeah, I know you're talking. catching them. And then what they'll do is they castrate them and then they, they push them back out and, uh, they'll, they'll grow up to be like five, 600 pounds. So they'll just see these monsters and they usually always mind it, uh, missing testicles, which I think is pretty cool. I think those dudes are into lifting if it's who I think it is. Yeah. Yeah, the 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 guy has a side by side with a minigun. I don't remember. He he he's. I've talked to him a couple like briefly about deadlifting or something. It's the same guy. It's like what is it's called like Lone Star Boars. Or yeah. Something? Yep. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Lone Star yeah, Boars. Yeah. yeah no, he, he's into lifting. Yeah, I, I kind of assume that uh, most people that are into that are probably into like lifting weights, into guns, um, probably into trucks, into something that involves a diesel motor and a turbo. I mean, there's like a Psych- psychologist would have a field day for sure. Yeah. Uh, barbecue, <laughs> like uh, uh, killing pigs, barbecue, hunting. Uh, like it's a it's a probably like, you know, you sit around, probably people have a lot of similar interests, at least in that deal. But uh, I, yeah. I mean, it was um, like I enjoy hunting them, but they were so destructive on the land and the amount of work that I was having to do to like fix what they were destroying that like, that's where it just got. And we have a little Barton Creek runs through our property. So I own both sides. So we have about 1400 foot of Creek and they would just come up through the wet Creek and then just like have different access points where I set up uh, trail camps. And then I just lay in bed and they would, my phone would buzz and I just go out there, fire it up and be like, and just knock them down with suppressors. And then just leave them. How close would they get to you? Um, I mean, I've shot them at, do they, at, do at, they get pretty close. Oh yeah. No, I mean, I've shot them at 50 foot. I mean, I've shot them at 250 yards. Too. Yeah. Cause we got, we got charged by, one the, I shot one in the ear the other day. I guess it didn't penetrate the brain. And this was probably in May and my kids and I were out walking and charged us in the morning. It waited up. I couldn't find it. it waited up all night and <laughs> had to lower the boom at that point, but we were all right. <laughs> no, I, um, uh, it was, I remember I killed a pretty big one. He was close to 300 pounds. Actually, his skull is sitting right over there. If you can see him, 
Um, but he was so big that I woke my kids up to get a picture with him just for like physical reference. And then I, I was like, man, I'm taking this right. head. So I'm out there with like, you know, my head, my foot on it and basically take a machete and I'm hacking its head off and my kids are out there watching. And I'm like, to this day, I still am going to laugh when they're older. And they're like, dude, my dad woke me up to take a picture of the pig. And then I watched him cut its head off, <laughs> put it in a bag. Then I tied a rope around its uh, feet yeah. and I basically did like a sled drag and like power walked him out all the way to my neighbors, which was probably like a legit 800 yards in the middle of the night, you know, with like a headlamp on and my kids are probably like, my dad is crazy. And then, uh, um, how old are your kids? Uh, my little girls, well, I call them little girls. They're 11 now. So I got twins and my little boy just turned seven. So this is probably okay. four or five years ago. So they were probably obviously, you know, seven or eight. My little boy was pretty young, but, uh, there's a kind of a rocky kind of area up on my neighbor's property. And I, what I'll do is I'll put the, the pigs out there and then I will set up a trail cam and then I leave. And then, you know, obviously just look at the pictures of what was showing up. I couldn't believe what showed up to eat this thing. It was like other pigs. There were skunks. It was possums. It was coyotes. It was like vultures. Like it was like everybody came to eat. You know, it's like that scene in the, uh, um, yeah. like in the, uh, Dude, they're uh, cannibals. I, I didn't know that either. I, yeah. You're exactly right about that. I've seen that too. Yeah, no, it was like the scene in like the Lion King where all the animals like show up together. It was like, you know, like, like the skunks over there eating with the possum. And then I just was like, holy shit, dude. And the vultures, which I'm sure you've seen over Texas, which are like, yes. But it's, uh, um, you know, as you know, coming from California, I always tell people, I'm like, man, Texas is an interesting place. Like if we, if, if mankind left like the Thanos effect, Texas would reclaim itself in six months. Yeah. Yeah. But. I, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, um, obviously playing in the NFL, I lived in Philly, which was hot. I lived in Tampa in the off season and then Kansas city, which is God awful. So like, it wasn't a bad move. Like I wasn't like, you know, surprised by this Texas or any of this other stuff. But so where'd you live before Texas though? The well, last we, uh, so I, I grew up in Southern California yeah, and, I knew and, that, and yeah. then, uh, I went to school at Berkeley and then okay. got drafted to the Eagles, uh, played in Philly. And then that first year I moved down to Tampa, Florida. My older brother was living down there and we bought a house. So I lived down there in the off season. And then when I went to the chiefs, I moved back to California and always just kept a house there and went back and forth. And then, uh, after I retired, I was just in California and then we started doing a bunch of military contracting and a bunch of stuff in, in 15, 14, 15, and then 16, it kind of, we were at an interesting crossroads just cause all the stuff we were doing at Fort Bragg. So it kind of necessitated a move. And, uh, mm -hmm. things in California, like it was an interesting piece too, cause, uh, I was effectively paying into a system that I didn't agree with and the way the state was going and that I just remember telling my wife, I'm like, I don't think I can keep paying taxes here. Like there isn't a single thing happening here that I support. And for sure. And then all of a sudden the military thing, it just kind of was like a perfect storm. And, uh, we, we came out and we, uh, as we were talking about it, I got an unsolicited offer on my house. Dude knocked on our door, said, Hey, I want to buy your house. Uh, wrote us a check and we were out 30 days later. And then at that point I was like, where are we going to go? And we came out to, uh, come out here to check out Austin. And I told my wife, um, cause when I, uh, my agent, uh, when I was playing the NFL was from here and he tried to get me to buy 40 acres next to him in 99, which makes me laugh. It's basically Spanish Oaks now, which is like, where all like the really rich people live. Um, and I told my wife, I'm like, I'm like, let me drive you to this little town I almost lived in. And so we drove out here and she's like, this place is great. And so we started looking for places and we found a, a 16 acres and made an offer and they accepted and we came out here and it was kind Legit. of, the, yeah. And I, I remember telling my wife, I'm like, God, oh, this is great. It's the country. It's kind of quiet. Like I like it. It's close enough to everything. And then all of a sudden COVID hit and I think like Rogan moves here and it was just like, all of a sudden this place turned into like the orange County of Texas. It like exploded. And, Even uh, where you're at? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, it, this is the area that exploded. Like, they, okay. they built thousands of homes around us in the last four years. Your value's probably gone up a ton, though, huh? Yeah. No, we've... On the house? Yeah. Well, I mean, they're, they're selling million and a half dollar homes on, like, a third of an acre lots now around the corner from us. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, we did well in that deal, but I, I wasn't necessarily moving here for that, for that reason. I was kind of moving here to kind of get away from as many people and to live a little bit more in the country, a little bit, you know, have a little more property. And if so if I, I joke, if I had known it was going to grow in this much, I would have moved way farther out. Yeah. So how did, how did you get to Texas? Um, I went over. So long story short is um, I was training people in Santa Barbara 
And um, the business wasn't going a- as well as I would expect. There's not as much serious people there. So I, I had an uncle in Nashville and I knew a lot of people out there from visiting already. Moved out there and like within like two weeks, I was already ahead of where I was in California and was really doing well um, tr- with all the training. And then um, I was training myself at Vanderbilt University and a friend of mine had moved down here to Texas to train at Metroflex gym. Mm-hmm. So I came down to visit and I'm like, I'm not married. I don't have any kids. Then now's the time to do it. So I moved down there a few weeks later and been here ever since. Yeah. I mean, the, uh, the Ronnie Coleman videos of Metroflex, uh, like that's how I know it, you know, seeing all like the, the crazy YouTube Ronnie Coleman videos. Well, that, so there's a lot of good gyms here. And my friend that moved here, he originally had said we should train at a gym called Stroud's Gym, which is like where, you know, Steve Goggins is. Oh, yeah. Oh, shit. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Steve Goggins and some of those guys had trained over there um, as well. And it's like, he didn't live here anymore at the time. But like, we, I'm like, I'm like I want to check out this place where Ronnie Coleman trains at. And um, we went in there and trained and had a really, really great workout. The owner, Brian, was super cool. And um, he barely knew how to use the internet, but somehow he tracked me down on there and wrote me an email, said, I really want you to come train here. Like, I, I know you'll love it, blah, blah, blah. And like, you know, just sort of like an open invite to come there. I'm like, let's go train at Metroflex. And like, you know, he he was super cool. And like, it was like, you know, most gyms are like, what are you doing? It was like, if we're going to go heavier, he's going to like get excited, put on whatever music we want, bring us out water. It's just kind of like wanted us to kind of bring back that atmosphere. Sure. Because Ronnie Coleman was training heavy at the time, but a lot of other people weren't as much. And my friend and I, I think we kind of got that going again where we, we had people, a lot of people training hard, heavy. Um, Branch Warren started coming back training there all the time. It, it was just a good vibe. I mean, it was like e- even when I was done competing – I would train a lot of, you know, a lot of people. Like, I'd train Johnny Jackson there when mm-hmm. he's getting ready for deadlift contests and powerlifting. And I literally had to, like, tell people straight up. I'm like, dude, we're making a rule here. I said, I purposely chose 11 a.m. on Tuesdays because nobody's here, hardly. Now we're getting 55 people in here, which is great. But I got this deadlift area right here on Tuesdays at 11 because we get people so excited. They'd have people coming in to want to train just because the energy was so high. Which is fantastic as long as they're not in the area and the bars we're using. And then it kind of like the energy in that place is like you could feel it from a block away. It was like nothing else I've experienced before because I I'd trained. That was all the thing why I kind of was moving around. When I was in like high school to teenage, I used to drive down from Santa Barbara um, to Yorba Linda, which is real far. It's about 140 miles away. There's a great gym down there. I was, I was used to training at those kind of places. And um, that's what I wanted, man. I understand you're responsible for your own atmosphere in a sense, but it's nice when that environment is just there instead of having to create it all the time. And that's what I got, man. It, it, it was awesome. I've trained a lot of good places. Even in Tennessee, it was good. I was training at Vanderbilt University. The strength coach was John Sisk. I think he's at Georgia State now. He gave me open access to the weight room, and I think he's one of the most underrated. Do you know who that is, John Sisk? Uh uh-uh. uh, I'm, I'm, um, no, I'm, that he's a really good strength coach. I think he's just not like known because he's not like self promoting or he doesn't like know, he doesn't know whose hand to shake and sure. what convention to speak at or attend. He just does his job and a damn good job at that. But it was like all these people were helpful. Like, go in there. What music do you want? Baseball coach of Vanderbilt would be in there. And he, instead of saying, like, you know, Hey, the baseball players are going to lift, you know, can you get out of here? It's like, no, I want them to see you lifting. Why don't you come back later and help me check out their squat and stuff? Just like been in some good places, man. That's awesome. Been pretty fortunate. What was the gym in your, uh, your Belinda? It's called your Belinda barbell club. It mm-hmm. was a guy named Paul Leonard and a guy named Art Labar. And, um, it was, it was, it was a really hardcore garage gym. Nice. The first time I went in there to train, there was, um, one guy in there was, I'm not going to say his name. Cause he, like, I don't know if he, he probably thinks it's funny, but I'll just keep him uh, his name out of it. He's still around. And I don't know how old he was, but he's quite a bit older than I was like 19. Most of the guys were 30 something. I think he was older. I thought he was, but now he doesn't look that old. I don't know what he was, but rumor <laughs> was he was, old. but now he doesn't. He looked pretty old for his age then, but now he look, had an age in like 20 years, uh, 20 years, whatever. You so, dude, so when he was 30, he looked 50. And now that he's 50, he still looks 50. 
Yeah, no, he's 60, looks 50. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So the dude was in there. I don't there know what's better. Like, or I don't know what's worse. There. Yeah, I don't either. I'm just, this is just what is, not 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 commentary on the good or the bad of it, but he was in there, and this fool is in there. I walk into to bench, because I was going to go squat with him on a Saturday. They're like, why do you, if, what are you doing Thursday? And I'm like, oh, I can come down Thursday too if you want. And why don't you come bench with us on Thursday as well? It's a real far drive, mind you. So I walk in there, and, um, this guy doesn't even look up and acknowledge me. The, the owner of the gym does. He's real nice. The other guys are kind of nice. And the one strongest guy, the older guy there, doesn't look up. He's reading Penthouse, dude, in between sets. And doesn't say anything. Okay, okay, whatever. Then he goes and ben- he goes and benches like whatever he did. Then he went to like 315, did it for like his PR was like 32 reps or something. And he got 35. Jesus. And he gets a smile on his face, doesn't tell us anything. And he just like w- leaves the gym, comes back and just watches us and eats Arby's and grinning the whole time. So I've been lifting around some crazy bastards, dude. And like, <laughs> it kind of was helpful to be able to like that young to be able to like learn how to act and stuff. And like, kind of like, you know, know when you should load plates and not, you know, that kind of stuff and kind of like the pecking order of a gym and stuff. So yeah. Yeah, and then that was a good gym. Um, trained another gym called in California called Body Shaping in Oxnard. It's like and then it became Gold's Gym with um a guy that really taught me how to lift named Steve Hall. Um, Santa Barbara Gym Fitness was really good back in the day, like when I was like in in probably when I was in high school to like elementary, like that's where Fred came in to train when he was doing ISSA stuff in Santa Barbara. And um yeah, dude, they, I couldn't believe it one time when I was in high school. I, I I told the owner of the gym off. I told him he's a fool to his face because he, Fred Hatfield came in there to squat. And he's like, he had the receipt for the day pass. I'm like, you charge Fred Hatfield to lift here? I'm like, this is like God in the lifting world. Like, we should be honored. He's like, to be in his presence and you charge this man? <laughs> like, come on, dude. Uh, and, and, you know, and Ed Cohn came through there, all, all sorts of people. Yeah, the uh, when I was in high school, um, so I've I've been lucky to be around be around be around the elite for since I was a little kid. Yeah, no, fuck, dude, that's uh, but like shit. I think um, did you ever go to Metrics? That was in Costa Mesa, Newport, right on Seventeenth. That was like kind of like the big bodybuilder gym. Um, I've not trained there, but I did check it out one time. That, that was that the, the, like early two thousands, kind of their heyday. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we used to go down there, and then when I moved to Newport, uh, we used to go train at that place, and it it had kind of lost a little bit of its luster. Um, but then like Troy Zuccolato bu- uh, bought it, and everything was yeah. purple, which was fucking awful. Um, and it was it was super weird, kind of like uh, I think he had like a a growth hormone like clinic that they were selling GH in the front, kind of a deal. And he was like walking around in a lab coat, like it was it was literally it was uh, it was yeah it was as ridiculous as it sounds. Like everything's purple. That dude's in like you know fucking spandex with like a lab coat, like prescribing growth hormone, and he's not a doctor. Did he, is he a doctor? No, I'm pretty sure he wasn't Doctor Zuccolato. But like yeah, they it was super fucking wacky. But what was cool, uh, the reason that I joined was uh, they had um, uh, um, they had basically had the original metrics equipment and then they brought in all this like extra bodybuilding shit that was all like kind of purple. So it was like you could see kind of like the like, you know, the different colors of like where the gym had been because metrics was like red and black and then it was like purple and black. So you had this like interesting mix of vomit yeah. equipment, but they actually had uh, one of the original uh, safety squat bars, which, um, you know, okay. uh, like the original ones. Um, and Zangus had one. Uh, so I like went there and I was like, Oh shit, they got a safety squat bar. So I would go there to use that bar, uh, for not only, you know, obviously back squats, but we would do like good mornings and then also, um, um, do some bench press stuff with it, which is, uh, I can't remember what the fucking movement, the bench press we did with it. It's kind of like more of a tricep thing where it kind of folds back and then press what do they call those. Um, Fuck, I'm totally forgetting. Um, like jam presses? Yeah, jam presses. Uh, so we would use that thing, and I would specifically go there like one to two days a week to use that bar just because I got to the point where like my shoulders were so I, – I just couldn't get into position. I could, but then like the shoulder kind of elbow issues I'd run right. into from squatting heavy, I just couldn't do it two days a week. So like any of the speed work I did or anything, I would just do on that or big reps. Um, and then uh, they – we came in one day and in the night they had sold the gym 
to this like weird, let me see if I put this, like imagine Orange Theory and CrossFit had a child that was like uh, Christian based, like born again Christians that had a fitness thing. It's fucking weird. <laughs> but like yeah, yeah, yeah. take like CrossFit, Orange Theory, Christianity, and like uh, a 12 step AA program and mix it into one. Um, and it was called the 12 and they had like a 12 step program. It was super fucking weird. All of a sudden I show up to my gym, the branding had changed in the night. Like we'd been there the day before there was new equipment and they took all the old equipment and just threw it outside in the parking lot. So I walk in and I was like, and they, they were like, Hey, you know what? Like, you know, your, your membership will extend. You just, here's a new gym. And I was like, where's all the old equipment? They're like, Oh, it's all out in the parking lot. And I'm like, what are you going to do with it? Like a guy's coming to just pick it up and take it away for scrap. So I like ran out there and I dug in the dumpster and found the safety squat bar. And the guy's like, Hey, uh, uh, like, you know, like, um, like, what are you doing? I'm like, uh, can I have this? He's like, yeah. Like, why do you want that old piece of shit? I was like, yeah, this thing sucks. Let me put it in my truck. <laughs> and that place was so weird. Um, I just remember the owner of the place. I was, um, like I've always been into like Chevy trucks and especially like K30 yeah. square, square bodies. So I had a pretty nice K30, all one ton stuff, obviously. And, uh, I like had my truck there and the guy like pulls up in this, um, what was it? It's a, I, I don't know the Jeeps all that well, but it's like a four door Jeep, modern warfare, JK, maybe Does that sound right. Four door mm. Jeep, modern warfare, yeah. a vision the guy had a three ninety two Hemi in it. Um, you know, so it was motor swapped. He had like $26,000 in Curry axles underneath it. It was like a rock jock 60 with a rock jock 80. It was all, you know, King coil over this and, like the guy was probably probably a buck fifty into this thing, and he's like pulling out receipts and like bragging to me about it, and I just was like, "Oh fuck, you're like the the wrong type of person." I like like you know the dude that's basically bragging to me how much how many light bars he has and how much he's fucking spent at a shop, and I'm like, he's like, "Who did all the work on your stuff?" I'm like, "Me." <laughs> he's like, "Oh," I'm like yeah, a little bit different type of people, you know. <laughs> this guy's showing me a hundred fifty thousand dollar JK, and I'm like over here with my fucking yeah, shaving yeah. one ton, you know. But yeah, just, uh, but it was, that, that was a cool spot when I was in high school. Um, you know, obviously in PV, our big deal was on Saturdays, we would drive to Venice Gold and like, try to like see the pro bodybuilders and like, kind of just like see like what we'd read about in the magazines. And that was always pretty neat. Who was training down there then? Uh, we saw Sean Ray, um, Paul Dillette was Mm -hmm. there. Um, and then. Uh, a bunch of other big fucking monsters. I just remember like when you walked in, those dudes were always like sitting around eating out of some big Tupperware. And I remember there was like a bunch of like really nice cars. Was that one was like on Rose Avenue or whatever? Uh, It was the original spot that it was in. I don't remember the street it was on, but it was like that warehouse that opened in the back. It's yeah. And it wasn't like right on the beach. It was like back a little way. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's the one. And, uh, but it was neat to just go there and like see those guys. Yeah. I know. I've been there a few times. Yeah, we, we got to meet Charlie Glass. He was a gymnast at Cal, which was pretty neat. I mean, that guy's still there. Um, I didn't. I never saw. I don't think Mike O'Hearn was there, but we got to see some. There were some pro football guys in there, but it was just neat to like. Uh, and then like uh, we where was it the firehouse? We got to go eat it there, and you know all the fucking dudes weird foods that they were eating like twenty seven egg whites and you know oatmeal and all that shit. So yeah, it, it was uh, it was neat to see that culture, and then just like the crazy outfits those guys were wearing. Like one dude looked like a fucking big ass bumblebee yeah, in spandex. Oh yeah, it was great. I just like like it, it was they were like cartoon characters. These fucking like big like Marvel weird spandex car, car, uh, you know cartoon characters lifting weights and eating in between sets. You know. Yeah. Did you ever yeah. go down to um that one powerlifting and bodybuilding gym over in Whittier? I think it's like Avenue Gym or something. Was supposed to be pretty good back then. Mm-mm. Was it? What was the other gyms down there? That you- uh, in San Pedro. Um, there was a big gym in San Pedro we used to go to that I'm totally forgetting the name of, but there was a, uh, there was a big pro bodybuilder, this guy named Al Jana that worked out there. We used to go train with, um, who was like a, a tremendous steroid pusher. I'm like 17 years old and he's like, what kind of juice are you on? I'm like, I don't even know what the fuck you're talking about. He's like, you know, like trying to basically push this stuff on us. I'm like, one, I don't have any money for this. And two, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. But, uh, yeah, there was a big gym right on Western, uh, in San Pedro, we used to train at obviously Zangus's and then, uh, you know, Venice Golds and a few other different places. But for the most part, um, you know, it was either, you know, uh, 24 hour fitness right on, uh, Hawthorne or sorry, Crenshaw on PCH was another big spot that we used to see a lot of pros in. So those were kind of like that South Bay area. I was, it was called South Bay gym. That's what it was. 
in San Pedro okay. was another big one. They had kind of an upstairs. There was always a lot of like big jack strong dudes in there. And um, it was like yeah. one of those things where like you go in and like you start like working out and like you instantly put an extra plate on everything just because you don't want to have some dude call you out and feel like they're going to jit sure. out the gym. You know, or, uh, you know, now in hindsight, it was probably us imagining things. But um, no, it was good. It was, it was a good atmosphere. I feel like it, um, you know, like obviously, and you know this, I mean, the Internet has made things so much more accessible. But I felt like if you were into that stuff, you kind of had to go search it out. It wasn't like pushed in your face like uh -huh. it is today. Not at all. Or you definitely go search it out. There was another one that was okay down there. The atmosphere was weak, but it had really good equipment. It was called LA Lifting Club over in Burbank. You ever go there? Mm -mm. No, they we had. Didn't. I don't know what the deal was. They had every new bell and whistle you get with powerlifting equipment. Really? They're not there anymore. No, I mean, in, any of the stuff in the valley, uh, like that kind of that part of LA was, uh, we just never kind of went there. Everything we went was kind of this way and even down to Orange County a little bit. But um, no, I mean, it was, uh, it, you know, it it's kind of like, I mean, I got into lifting weights, um, obviously, because I wanted to play football. And uh, and then I realized I really liked being strong and being mm -hmm. strong, playing football just kind of worked together. And when I went to the, the gym, I got stronger. So it just kind of was a natural progression and I grew bigger. And, you know, these other people are like, oh, I fought to gain weight. I'm like, I just kept growing collar and just kept eating. And every time I went to the gym, I got stronger on something. So um, it felt like a natural kind of piece. But uh, it was something that, and I, I do, I've told the story on the podcast. Um, I was 10 years old and there's a thing in Southern California. Did you guys have something called junior lifeguards? You know, did you ever remember what that is? I didn't do it, but I, I, my brother did it. Yeah, I know what it is. Huh? Okay. So that was like a, a cultural thing for us for where we grew up in that PB Torrance kind of Redondo beach area. So, uh, you started at like 10, I think mm -hmm. I went in at like nine. My mom had to lie for me. Cause she's like, you're not sitting around another summer. You gotta go do something. So we would, uh, uh, go in the morning, go to junior lifeguards, end at lunch, eat our lunch. And then we would surf until like two or three in the afternoon. And I remember we were at like one of the aid stations learning CPR from some of the lifeguards. And there was like, almost like, like right where like the lifeguard station was, there was like a boardwalk, you know, like the strand. And uh, all of a sudden we heard like somebody scream and we like commotion. And we thought that they're like, somebody had fallen down or something. We were gonna like run down there and help. So we're like looking and it was like just this mass of people. Like we couldn't tell what was going on. And all of a sudden like, the people parted and it was a dude walking down the strand and uh he was like head bigger than everybody he was fucking wearing like little tiny kind of like gray shorts tank top big gold chain hairy chest just like massive fucking chest like you could like yeah. sit a drink can on this dude was just strolling and people were like <gasps> like gasping and it was like something out of a movie like parting the red seas and this dude just kept strolling by and we were like like this he looked like a superhero yeah. And then, the, and then there was like a long kind of cement ramp and he like started and like ran up the ramp and came down and ran it three or four times. And we watched this dude and we were like, who, like, like what, uh, like, what is this? And, uh, he got done and we went back and we were talking and we were like, oh my God. And I remember being like, what, like, like we were just in awe of this dude. And it was, uh, Lyle Alcedo who mm. you know, obviously played D tackle for the Raiders. And so he lived in the area and he used to come down walk on the beach and go run you know like run the the ramp and uh for his conditioning and dude he looked like a superhero and i remember thinking like i want to lift weights if that if like that dude lifts weights i want to lift weights i want to look like a superhero and uh that was kind of what like got me into it i remember telling my dad i want to lift sure. weights my dad's like why do you want to do that it's counting to 10 over and over again Just morons do that and I was like, no, no, I want to do this. So that's kind of what I got in. And then when I went to go play football in high school, like that was kind of where I got into it. And that was kind of like the big push. I just remember seeing that dude and the way people reacted. And I was like, that was pretty cool. I'd like, I'd, I'd like some of that. Yeah, for sure. I got it from watching pro wrestling as a kid. So my dad would take me down to LA to watch WWF, what it was called then. So that's how I got into it. So, uh, you know, so you, you obviously get into lifting weights and training and, you know, working with athletes and stuff like, you know, your competitive uh, powerlifting thing was pretty damn, pretty damn impressive. I mean, what, 600 pound bench, which there aren't too many people walking around with a 600 620 pound bench. Raw, yeah. 620 raw. Mm -hmm. I mean, what are there probably like 10 people in the world that have benched over 600 raw? There's more than that now, but yeah, it, it was definitely, yeah. So what was so, the big drive? I mean, was it, uh, you know, you were, I mean, obviously had supporting lifts, but the bench was the big driver for you? Say, um, yeah, because I think part of it was 
I think people are naturally attracted to what they're good at. So like I, I got really good in squat and deadlift too, but it wasn't like, especially squat took forever. Deadlift, even though my leverages aren't too good, I was okay at that. But bench, I, you know, usually people develop it later. I was always good at bench press. And I just kind of went after it at that point because I found something I really liked and I was naturally good at. So it was kind of like a recipe for success. What did the training look like? And then I'd access to the, well, I'd access to people. One of my dad's best friends was a powerlifter who benched um, 540, like back in the 80s in a meet. So I had access to like, to good people early on. So even like when I was like in, um, you know, sixth grade and stuff, bench pressing, it, it wasn't like a perfect program, but it was probably better than most adults do, right, you know, right now, just from from learning from people and, and observing and, and things like that. Like, so what the pro- training looked like mainly was um, for the my most success would be one heavier primary bench press day. Then um, one one day where I focus more on shoulder and, and tricep strength. So the first day would be, basically if you divided it up and almost be like a a bottom end day and a top end day in a sense. With the the top end, you know, it's like different than like I would do it more like like Fred would do it. So I would do like say a heavy set, then do the lighter compensatory acceleration sets converse to like a Louis that does it like two separate days. Sure. So I would do like your heaviest set say. Come down to your down sets after. Focus on moving the bar as explosively as possible. Um, you know, getting the tightness right, get the technique dialed in, building that motor pattern. And that's kind of like, you know, obviously you need to touch the heavy weight, but that's kind of where the real magic would happen. Say that's on a Monday. Rest till Thursday or Friday and do the secondary day. Focus on like overhead pressing of some sort of variation and more closer grip and tricep stuff. This episode of Power Athlete Radio is powered by Train Heroic, the most immersive strength training app experience on the market. We've built our online training business by partnering with Train Heroic and helping us deliver all of our world-class training programs like Jack Street, Field Strong, and Grindstone. To learn which Power Athlete training program best suits your goals, head to powerathletehq.com slash training. And if you're a coach looking to build a business with the best tech and training, Go to trainheroic.co forward slash power athlete HQ. And now back to the show. Yeah, I remember um, we kind of did a similar deal in that uh, George clumped in the bench and the deadlift together and that those are like movements that you only hit the the main mover once a week. Whereas he was convinced that you could like, you know, train your shoulders and squat almost every single day. So it's like, you know, like the volume, he just was real, like real finicky on like the, uh, mm. the bench, like, um, you know, we would bench heavy one day a week. And then like the next training day was like real big into the shoulders and a lot of dips. And I remember asking him like, dude, we squat like two or three times a week. And he's like, you know, the legs can take more stress than the bench and the deadlift bench or deadlifting. He was like, what do you, what do you say about deadlift? It was like a pretty girl. You got to ignore it. <laughs> so, yeah, but I, I agree with you on that. That's a, and so, uh, but you started benching yeah, you, heavy um, early on. I started benching heavy, like in sixth grade and then like dicking around, like, in you know, five, six years old, I'd sneak into the weight room at the Y. So I've always done it. Yeah. I mean, I, I just would, I mean, heavy relatively, right. Not like yeah, sure as best so, as I could do. Well, like, like what kind of numbers did you hit when you were like 18, 22, 25? I mean, like mm. when, like, like at what age did you bench six? Would you say 615, 620? 620 was like 22. So that was, uh, or no, that might be like, oh, like 24. I hit 600 at 22. And um, after that, I got, out of, I got out of powerlifting and just focused more on training athletes. And I, so I got out of that point, I kind of got out of powerlifting. And just focus on more overall development, like, you know, like you're talking about more training, like more like an athlete, mm-hmm. do more sprinting, you know, rucking, things like that versus like just lifting heavy weights all the time. Mm-hmm. Kind of want to basically my idea was I want to be have the conditioning of somebody 50 pounds lighter, the movement capacity of somebody 50 pounds lighter, but the strength of somebody 50 pounds heavier when I got out of powerlifting because I bulked up hard and it was... um I'd say like when I was weighing like up to to 275, maybe it was fine. Like it wasn't like any noticeable difference unless you're, you know, I, maybe if I wanted to, you know, 
hike the Sierra Nevadas or something. I might know, but like if normal day to day life, it wouldn't be any difference. But like once I started pushing like three hundred and stuff, I didn't feel as good. Uh, how tall are you? Um, I'm like between. I'm a little over five eleven. <laughs> So five, five eleven three hundred. Yeah, so uh, that's yeah. a tough. That's some tough bill. <laughs> yeah, exactly, dude. So it was like, but it was like it, it's it was weird. It's like I'd find a certain point where I just it would hit like it. So then it got as I got longer, I could get a little heavier, like two ninety. So if I'm two eighty five doing strongman, I'm in pretty damn good condition. Like yeah. really good condition for that size. Like I could do like I'd do like hundred yard. You know, talk about Charlie Francis, like tempo runs, things like that, and be fine. But I noticed when I get over 290, I'd be like, one day at college, I saw a guy that I knew, an older guy. He's like, hey, want to walk some laps on the track and talk? I said, sure. So I was walking. I'm just like, this isn't hard on my lungs, but, dude, like my lower back and calves are like dying, you know? And it was like that 15, 20 pounds. So once I got done lifting, I dropped down pretty quick because I just I didn't want to stay up that heavy. It just yeah. didn't feel good. No, I mean, my heaviest, uh, I weighed 326. And um, uh, that was uh, like way too heavy for me. Right around 300 pounds is always pretty good. But like, You're like I, six I, five though, right? Yeah, just like six five. I'm uh, NFL six five and three quarters, which actually probably makes me six six because they like smash you down. But I wonder okay. if I have, my neck is shrunk. My uh, my my daughter makes fun of me. She calls me the thumb. She's like, you're she she like put her thumb up. She's like, your neck and your head are the same size. And I'm like. That's not a bad thing. I've been training my whole life to have a big neck. <laughs> that's and, uh, a good thing. Yeah, I was like, dude, that's uh that's not an insult in any ways, but uh um I was going to thank you. You you posted uh How much we, you weigh now? Uh, I'm like 275, 276. Okay. You know, so like in like 270, 275 somewhere in there, I kind of float a little bit. Um, you know, if I do more conditioning, it's mm -hmm. less and but I still feel pretty good and still train and you know, uh, bang weights and we do, I, I train some professional jujitsu fighters. So I train with them and roll with them That's a couple awesome. days a week. So it's been uh, like after all the, you know, 10 years in the NFL and the injuries and all the training and everything to be able to go out and roll with these guys has been, it's been like a testament to me and the training that like, fuck, I must've done something right. That the fact that I can still compete at a pretty high level and, uh, the conditioning piece is obviously real important. Like I still don't like Absolutely. to be out of shape, but yeah, it's, uh, um, yeah, the uh, shit, dude. So you start training athletes, and uh, like, how did the? Uh, I mean, dude, I'm uh, like two things. One, um, what I was saying was, uh, you had like a neck device, like this kind of like pad on your website. Uh, I ended up buying yeah. it. It's like a, just a plastic little like neck strong deal. Neck strong neck, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, I picked that up, and we do a whole bunch of manual resistance neck with the guys, but also with a bunch of like uh, I want to like oh, cool. the old school neck straps. But I really like that one for the side stuff. I just used it this morning, so I uh, I thought that was a pretty simple. good one. Well, it's simple. I was using I was doing towels, so I would like take a towel and then like smash it on my head, and then when uh, I bought yep. that or when I saw it, I was like, "Fuck, that's so smart." It's got a little post on it, so I don't have to hold the plate. I can just hold the post, so it's a good piece, man. Yeah, exactly. But uh, I dig the jail strong. I mean, uh, I like it. it's uh, it's hysterical, especially when you start talking about like the gas station ready and like uh, ravishing Rick Rude and some of the old wrestlers, because I remember all that stuff as well. And I still to this day, when you post that stuff, like now realize the condition that those guys were in. I mean, I, I knew they were fucking jacked back then. But today, mm -hmm. when I look at it, realizing the conditioning that those guys were on the ring in and their work schedule and what those guys did in terms of like 300 shows a year and the amount of partying they did which makes it a hundred times more impressive absolutely especially when we talk about that, all the partying and stuff they did yeah it's uh like mark calloway the undertaker is our neighbor and um oh, over the years have met like a decent amount of professional wrestlers and just like the level of drinking and partying that those guys did, like that's what just blows me away. I'm like, those guys are on, you know, 300 shows. They travel, like they're in different hotels. They're drinking to, you know, four o'clock every morning. Uh, and that, that dude steps on, takes his shirt off and is absolutely shredded. Like to me, that's fucking, it's the most impressive thing I've seen. Uh, it's crazy. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> you know? So how did, uh, how did that, I mean, was that just your personality that you were on the social, just trying to basically put a spotlight on a whole bunch of stuff that for some reason the internet doesn't seem to remember? Yeah, exactly. Just kind of bring back, um, I think there's a lot of people that find it interesting and I think it's cool to like kind of highlight the people that have inspired you too. So all, all that kind of stuff to like the historical part. And then if nothing else, like you're saying, just the entertainment. I mean, 
I think back then, like there's a lot of entertaining. Like I wouldn't like, for example, Metrics Gym if they paint it purple. But you have some bodybuilder walking around in spandex in a lab coat. That's classic. I mean, like <laughs> we don't get stuff like that anymore. And I think like, or you know, like people arrested for you know fighting at Waffle House at five a.m. and stuff for and, and all that stuff. It's just hilarious, and I think it, it just it entertains people, and it's good history. Uh, the gas station ready one, uh, like if you've ever driven uh, cross country or traveled at all, and like you know pulled into some random. Uh, I mean, dude, this has happened to me many times, you know, two in the morning, pull into some just random gas station. You get out, you're the only dude there. And there's like one random truck at another stump and you're like, or a, a pump and you're like, oh, fuck, dude, thank God I got my gun here. But like, yep. you know, you're like looking for all of these like interesting things. Like you're pumping your gas, you have your door open and you're just kind of looking. So like that one was pretty hilarious for me because I'm like, man, I have been gas station ready to the point where I've been like, I'll find a different place to take a leak. And I'm definitely not going into this store because I don't know what the fuck's going to happen at this place. So, I dude, I had one like that. Um, we, we were driving back to California, um, just to visit my parents during um COVID, and my kids wanted to do a road trip, so it'd be fun. We'll go, we'll just drive out there instead of fly. And we drive like we we're taking weird ways to get there just so we could see a bunch of stuff and like went through New Mexico. I thought I was about to get in like that at, at the at the I was just pumping my gas, everybody's in the car in um santa it was in santa fe new mexico which i thought is a pretty nice place but it, maybe we're in a bad part it didn't it seemed like a shithole to me but may, again we could have been in a bad part and um yeah i literally thought it was, I, i'm like i was like i was, wish my wife was recording this i thought that something's about to happen some um dude like homeless dude like gets like right up on me and he gets close and he's like i didn't know what to do because he was getting really close so i just screamed get the fuck away from me like real loud like three times i did have a gun with me so i mean but and he goes like this and like backs off and walks away okay this is over good then he goes in the middle of the parking lot and starts screaming i know fucking english i know fucking english like i said he didn't know english because he looked like native american to me but i don't know what he was but he got in the middle of the parking lot. I'm like, dude, this is about to be on. And luck, nothing happened. But yeah, I mean, I've had so many strange situations at gas stations that I can think of like it's like, but it all comes down to a lot of it. People don't think is like your training in the sense of like the intimidation factor. I guarantee you. Had I been 160 pounds and out of shape or something, I would have got shook down for money for sure. I would have had to use the gun probably. Where uh like where did that start? I mean, like where you uh, like put that on social where you were in a situation okay. like, oh, fuck, dude. Like, I just wonder what what like the like so what first moment was my best friend um, and I his name's Adam Benchia. He's out in California and he we do the jailhouse strong stuff together. And he was he teaches jitsu amongst other things. So he kept saying when he was teaching people like he was like, um, you know, if we go to a if this happens, if someone runs up on you at a gas station and he's, I heard him say that a few times, people kind of giggle and think it's funny. And like, like it seemed like people liked it. And, um, I'm like, dude, we need to come, I mean, we need to hashtag this. I'm like, you keep talking about this gas stations. Like, let's simplify it. Gas station ready. I'm like, every time we can all, I just like that story I just told you, everybody's got some story of something that's happened at a gas station yeah. always does. And it's usually if you're like, hopefully you can diffuse the situation. Like if you're just, like I said, like I would say 90% of it plus is going to simply come down to just the look. I mean, those, they're not, people aren't waiting at gas stations for some sort of challenge. They're waiting for like easy prey. They don't like to get up in the morning, but I'm going to go to find the toughest dude I can find at the gas station and like test my physicality to see what I'm made of. No one's thinking that. They're thinking, <laughs> you know, who can I shake down to get some cash? Yeah. And, <laughs> they're looking for easy and you know whether the, the, the it should be judged just off a look or not that that's the reality of it i mean besides your body language it's, it's your physique so since you started doing this how many people have reached out in dms and personal stories and shared oh, their like like too many to recount yeah yeah for sure it's like um and uh some of them are like you know really good stories and and like you know like oh man that's awesome like get you know entertaining classic other people are like the opposite like oh yeah 
there was like this homeless bum, like 300 yards away that kind of looked at me, but then he looked away, you know, the other people are like <laughs> dragging people across the gas station, and they got done with them, got the, you know, the pump out, put a little gas on them for a good measure at the end. You know, it's like, I get a whole wide variety. <laughs> Dude, there's a, um, as you were talking about it, there's a video, uh, it had to be in Europe just because of the cars, but this guy's at like a gas station he's pumping his gas and these dudes pull up in a van and block him and they jump out to basically rob him. And the dude just basically picks up the, uh, uh, the gas dispenser, like the, the pump and just starts yeah. fucking like hosing the dudes in the face and they realize it's gas and they're like, ah, and he's just fucking hosing them down. They all jump back in the car and drive away. I've watched that probably close to a hundred times. And, uh, I don't know with for sure certainty as those guys jumped out, if I would have been sharp enough to lift the gas fucking to pull it out and hose them with gasoline. Now, That's cool thinking, dude. after seeing it, I know exactly what my move is. And, uh, right. you know, I've, I obviously have a diesel truck, so it's probably not going to be the same, but they'll still get fucking scared to death of it. But, uh, yeah, uh, I've like watched that video and I even sent it to my brother who's a criminal defense attorney in LA and he's like, that is some fast thinking. He's like, I don't know if I would have thought to do that either, but shit. And I mean, that's a, that's a pretty good one. Um, the other one is the Tijuana Barbell Club. Oh, uh, that's based more off of, um, basically like just people we've met that like, I just told you the stories earlier, like just kind of like not throw their name out there though. Yeah, that's fine. You, Loca- can, protect, you, you can change the name. name for the incident. Yeah. It's called, what do they call that? I think in literature, they call that magical realism, where you do basically everything's based on truth, but there could be exaggerations like name changes. So like, you know what I mean? That's it's a genre of literature of like where the, the nucleus is true, but there's some change to it. Like it's kind of like how old people tell stories. They kind of like, you know, embellish them and stuff a little bit, but they're in general true. My dad used to say, don't let the truth get in the way of a good story. There you go. Yeah. So how did that all come about? The truth is an inspiration for a good story, but <laughs> maybe not yeah. the whole story. <laughs> yeah. So how did, yeah, how, I mean, how did that whole thing come about? I mean, cause you, you have some, I, I wanted to jump in on some of your books, but the T1 yeah. Barbell Club and that, I mean, those are. Basically to tell stories about people we've met along the way and, and then tie it into training. Because I think a lot of, um, a lot of the, not that like necessarily like people are buying books on training to be entertained, but I, I do think like sometimes we get a little lazy when they put stuff together and there's not really like any sort of like um, kind of soul to the, to the, to the book you're buying. It's more like just a, a spreadsheet or something versus like, you know, how, how'd you get to this place? You know, like kind of like how you, and a lot of times we have a good story with it. People are going to remember it more for the, Hey, like, this is how, stumbled upon for example until you want about cluster sets okay boom how did this happen oh i'm gonna remember this is what that guy said and, and that kind of thing it's yeah, funny the, i read a pretty good book the other day um do you know who um zach Avanesh is of course yeah, yeah no his iron journey book it's not really like if you're looking to to get your training knowledge up it probably wouldn't be the book but if you want just like a good read that kind of like it's a damn good read yeah, he sent me over some clips. Uh, I call it barbell soft porn. <laughs> that's that's uh, that, okay. that, that's the genre I gave him. Like uh, I was like I was like Zach. I feel like I'm reading like a penthouse letters from like a uh, barbell magazine. So he's like, oh, that's what I'm going for. <laughs> but I, I was yeah. laughing. I was laughing at the bar uh, at the Tijuana I Barbell mean, Club because when I that. when I was in college, um, you know, our joke was always like two things: like either that guy like bought a place on Jack Street, which is one of our programs, which means that you know something he's magically putting on muscle or the other one was uh he went down and he basically joined a gym down in tijuana we didn't call it the tijuana barbell yeah, club yeah, but yeah. he's like hey uh i heard that this summer that guy went down and joined a gym down in tijuana is that true down off a of revolution which was kind of our other joke then he obviously went down to the pharmacia so those were kind of like two jokes that we had that would we would just kind of throw out there and be like man you're not very strong you might have to like move to tijuana and join a gym <laughs> well i know one yeah i mean i know a guy i used to live with a couple, I actually made a, a article in newsletter about this the other day, but I changed the names again. This is 100% true from what he was saying. I mean, I guess I, I never went with him, so I can't verify it. But he would go down there, a couple of them, and they would go down there. They told me this one was like 20. I, didn't, I had no idea this stuff was even going on. I was like horrified at first hearing about it. They would go down to Tijuana. They said in like they would get um, the shot of Sustanon 250. And then the syringes like preloaded 
And they said they were like um, very hard to get in. They were like, they're kind of dull. They weren't like just slip it in. <laughs> and they get, there was some Mexican doctor down there. They said he smelled like a liquor cabinet and he had a, he'd wear a cowboy hat and he'd come in like dangling in the office, like with syringes in his hand. He'd give him one. He give him one in each shoulder, one in each quad, one in each butt cheek. I'm like, you did like 1,500 milligrams of one. Like, yeah. If you're going all the way to Tijuana, that's what we do. They go there once a week, they say, for the last <laughs> eight weeks going up to a powerlifting meet. So their test levels would they do this, this fool- and then three days later, it'd be like this. Yeah, exactly. And But it was like so funny. You're saying like this guy would come in the office with a cowboy hat on and be stumbling around smelling like tequila. I'm like, yeah, uh, basically sticking him with like rusty straws. Yeah, I mean that's what I look for in a medical setting, right? You know? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> what the hell? No, I I, um, uh, I do know <laughs> another power lifter who told me this story that they used to just walk across every couple of days, uh, do whatever they're going to do, and walk back. And I guess the uh, border patrol guys would always make jokes to them, and they were like, "Hey, you guys don't have anything on us." They're like, "Not on us, but in us." And so that was their kind of their joke that they. Uh, Where, when was that? Like what years? Uh, I want to say that was probably like early 2000s maybe late 90s this might be the same person that you talked to well they're down in the orange county area the person but um yeah but they were saying that um that at some point it said it changed though like of like where it was sort of like you're saying joking around to when they like anybody remotely like lifts weights they would get harassed and like pulled to the side and like basically like search for an hour because i think i think it was easier before 9 11, because you, you used to not need. When I was a little kid, my dad would took us out of Mexico a few times, and like it was like a two hour trip. You're in San Diego, you just go down across the border, do what you're going to do, like eat or walk around. And actually, he wouldn't let us eat. He'd say, you get sick, but we'd walk around and, and do that stuff and come back. And it wasn't that big of a deal to get there. It was like, I'm talking like, some you know 30 seconds either way to get across and no passports where i think after 9 11 you need even passports to go to canada I, I haven't been to mexico lately but i know when i went to canada i did a couple seminars there a couple years ago and you had to have some you had to have passports even go to niagara falls and stuff just walk across so when i was a kid similar deal uh like on a saturday there were many saturdays where you know we were i don't know uh, did what my dad asked us and did a bunch of fucking yard work or, you know, basically like had a list of chores that we would knock out. Like on Saturday morning, my dad would start banging on the windows at like six thirty seven a.m. And we had uh, like wash cars and it was like mm. this whole like I'm pretty sure my dad had us so that we were his uh, cheap labor force. But there was like a whole list of shit. And if we got it done and we had been like positive attitude and not busted his balls the whole time, he'd be like jump in the car and we would drive from where we lived. We would drive down to the border and there was a little um, town just kind of right outside Rosarita beach called uh, Puerto Nuevo. And it's all lobster restaurants. That's it. I mean, it's literally like every spot in town is, is a different restaurant. And there was a place that we would go and he had a spot and they would go upstairs and we could look out and see the ocean and we could get lobsters and we go down there for lobster tacos. And, uh, my mom and dad would go with us. And obviously cause we were kids and we would drive and drink a whole bunch of beers and eat lobster tacos, get in the car and we would drive home. And we would, I mean, we didn't do it every weekend, but probably, you know, once every two months we did, you know, three, four five times a year. Uh, that's how few times we were probably good wow. to help my dad the way, but yeah, we would do that constantly. And we would literally just drive, you blow right past the border, go there, get in the car. I mean, it was a, you know, probably two or three hour drive and then eat and then drive home. And, uh, I don't wow. even remember, I mean, it was maybe short wave, you know, wave at the border and drive back across, you know, and especially as you're waiting at the border at TJ, you know, people sell all the shit, like the chiclets and all the other stuff walk up. But I remember 10 cars and driving through and as a little kid. And that was like, it was nothing to drive down to Mexico for a day and come back and have lunch and then come back. And then, like you said, after 9-11 and the cartels and all the crazy shit, now it's just way different. Yeah, anybody, anybody I've talked to has been down there real recently says that you definitely, at least, I don't know about real recently, but you get pretty harassed going down there. If you're remotely big, you're going to get searched and all this stuff. Um, I was in, people were the border patrol or not. I don't know if it's our border patrol or theirs. Whoever was saying I was reading about people would go down there to get their goodies, come across, get nabbed by the border patrol or who, or I don't know if it's ours or theirs. 
they would take confiscate the goods and give them back to the pharmacy. So the pharmacy would basically play with play ball with the cops. So you get your stuff, you come down, you get confiscated. They the pharmacy gets their stuff back, so they're not paying for it. I mean, you're, they're not ever losing any product; they're just restocking it. Yeah, probably. I have nice. no idea if that's actually true, but I've read that a few places. Uh, I don't think it would be a surprise. Um, I think uh, you know, going to Mexico has always been shady. I mean, uh, I, I just had some buddies that competed in the yeah. Baja Five Hundred um, that were down there, and I, I asked him, I was like, "How was it?" And he's like, "Ah, you know, if you go down." you know, with a, with a pre-runner in a truck and like you're on a race team, like they just waved people through. There was their own special lane because, you know, the cartels control all of Baja in that area and they know that it's good for business. I mean, that's why, you know, there's no crime in Cabo San Lucas because the, you know, that was all built with, you know, kind of cartel money. So the last thing they're going to do is, you know, effectively tint their, one of their greatest forms of making money, which is the hotels and the travel and all that stuff. Is Cabo pretty safe? Yeah, really safe. Like, um, like Pedregal and, uh, um, all that, you know, San Jose, I mean, that whole area down there was all built by the cartels. Um, you know, if you go to any of those like real high end hotels, you know, I mean, it's really nice and you know, the crime, there's no crime. I mean, it's super safe, especially in that part. Um, you know, Ensenada and that it's a little bit more dicey, but, uh, my buddy went down and he's like, man, it was super safe, but also, you know, we're with race teams and we're spending a lot of money in that. And like, they're real good on like protecting their revenue streams. And not letting it's, like little Cabo bullshit criminals. Is it not so? It's I imagine it's not so humid like the Caribbean. Uh, yeah, no, Cabo's not humid. I mean, it's hot. Um, but then so like we just my, went to Punta Cana and we were sweating our we were sweating our asses. Oh, uh, uh, Punta Cana or like Punta Mita, like any of that stuff that's on like the mainland, kind of like Puerto no- uh, Puerto Vallarta and that kind of area down there. Punta Cana is um, Dominican. Oh, it's in the oh, okay. Shit, yeah, that's humid as fuck. Oh, dude, it was like, oh, it's only 85 and you kind of like go outside for a minute. It's not bad at all. But then as soon as you start walking or something, it's, it, I, I mean, I sweated less when it was 108 here yesterday because it was fairly dry. Uh, I do miss California this time of year for the weather. But uh, every time I go home, I'm always like, oh, thank God I don't live here anymore. Just like one one travel on the 405 where it's seven lanes either way and you're just stuck in bumper to bumper. I'm like, fuck, I don't think I could live in this anymore. When's the last time we were there? I, we were there like spring break, whenever that was, some March or something. Uh, I was just out there for IBJJF Worlds in Long Beach. Um, so um, the the guy that I trained, Victor Hugo, uh, he won double gold. He won uh, the ultra and the absolute. So he, uh, you know, basically smashed the whole thing. So he, um, those guys went out, the guys I work with obviously, uh, went out there to compete. So I flew out there just to see it and to hang out with them and kind of be there when it all went down. So that was the last time I was out there, which was probably in June. You know what? Eric seems pretty decent out there. So I've been out there. I've done three seminars at one, one particular gym in San Diego area. Like, no, I don't, I don't know that area North County. It's kind of like, it's not too far from Vista. I don't know the exact town. I forget the exact called iron monger's gym have you heard of that uh uh-huh. is it's it good? good yeah it's a damn good gym and that's a nice area it doesn't seem like so weird like the rest of california <laughs> like san diego seemed a lot nice you know what i mean like a lot yeah. nicer than like if uh um if i were moved back to california i think the only place i would live is that like north of monterey that cambria area um, I love that, that, that part of Southern California or sorry of, of California, that like central kind of coastal area. Like every time I'm there, I'm like, man, this would be the only part I wouldn't move back. I could County. handle, I don't do Orange County. I could definitely do, I, I could live with, I mean, I wouldn't want to, but I could definitely live with North, the Northern part of San Diego. That seemed, it's all like scrunched together, a little more, you know, open space and stuff. Yeah. It's not bad. Uh, so what, um, so you, you teach seminars, uh, like give me a rundown of the seminar. Like, like what, uh, like what are you taking people through it's performance training, powerlifting, just strength training, or just kind of the stuff like similar to what we saw you teach with Fred? Um, depends. So I've been doing a lot more. The, the ones with Fred were real condensed, obviously, cause we were doing like two of us in like a, three hours or so. Um, so I've done them anywhere from like three day full days of eight hours a day to like, you know, one generally it's gonna be at least a one hour, I mean, a one day seminar. So what I do is I basically I'll, figure out what the person wants ahead of time. So for example, but within my wheelhouse, I'm not like saying if you came down and said, Hey, like 
come to Austin and teach us Pilates, I'd have to pass on it because I wouldn't know what the hell I'm doing kind of thing, you know? I mean, like within my areas of expertise. So either going to be powerlifting a lot of times. And then with that, we um, it's gone more from a, um, say like a, it used to do mostly like when you came to Fred, like a PowerPoint type of deal, but longer, you know, longer and getting deeper in it. And then a little bit of lifting. Now it's been more of like practical. Where, and then people seem to like Q&A. What I always tell the person hosting the seminars, if no one asks anything, which has never happened, I'll have a PowerPoint prepared so we can at least give people their money's worth. But generally people like Q&A. So I've been going with lately with more Q and A of like we're gonna do the th- we're gonna go, we usually go squat first, then deadlift just because like deadlift the squat kind of warms you up for the deadlift, and you know and then bench press. Um, sometimes wait till after the lunch break, but usually try to get all three in. Take do them, um, take a lunch break, then do Q and A for a few hours after that and be done, and that's worked really well. I'll sometimes do them more for. Um, more of like tactical kind of training. So we're talking more like earlier, like we had mentioned of like the the premise is in my mind, you want to move like you're lighter, have the conditioning like you're lighter, but the strength of somebody heavier. That's kind of the easiest way to sum it up. So I have a program on there called called 50 cubed, basically meaning you want to be, uh, you want to basically perform in a 50, 50 pound differential, whether it's lighter for the movement and the endurance and speed or heavier for the strength. And that's the idea of like, how, how do we accomplish this? Okay, we're going to go over like different strategies, do that. Or strongman or speed, speed power type of training. Those are kind of where, where I specialize in. Mm-hmm. But, and then, so I would talk to the person ahead of time, say, okay, who's coming to the seminar generally? Because generally the people would know me coming. So it's not like we're going to like, it's not random. Let's not like ISSA sending out a newsletter and like people just want to see you or something. So they're showing up and we, they don't have any interest. We're going to, we're going to know, be able to figure out who's there and then what they want. So like example, if it's, I usually cap them 30 people because of the practical part. Mm-hmm. And I said, okay, we, if we got 28 people there, we know compete in powerlifting. This is a powerlifting seminar, but however, if you show up, you can really ask whatever you want in the Q and a, I mean, I always tell people with the Q and a, Anything about your lifts, ask what we're doing. So like if you say, hey, when I squat, should I widen my stance out right here and I watch you? I'll answer that question right there. But, if you know, what's your, you know, what are your thoughts on compensatory acceleration training for beginner or something like that? I'd have to wait till after because I need to say focus on the 30 people lifting and get that dialed in. Because if a lot, I don't usually have people go pretty heavy at these things because, most of the people, I'm not the person. So if you're new to lifting, I'm probably not the person to like, all right, here's how we get you lined up. I mean, I'm thinking like go in there with an intermediate or above and then make tweaks to make that person optimize their technique. Not like, okay, I've never squatted. I, I was weird. I had to figure that out on the fly because I did have somebody in Massachusetts. I don't know how they even found out about this. I'd never really lifted like at least on with free weights. And when she was going to squat, I was kind of like, oh, we're going to change your hand placement. She just like moved her arms under the bar and just fell down in the rack. Like, I'm not used to seeing that. I'm used to people having the awareness to know if you like put your arms over here, the ball is going to fall. Never, it doesn't cross my mind that could happen because I train people that are intermediate or advanced. Sure. So, you know what I mean? So like generally it's going to be, we're going to tweak the technique, get it right. Oftentimes people hit PRs because we can just hit like, they need to go heavy enough for a technical breakdown. So if you're a decent lifter, like you say, you know, you're tripling 535 on bench. I'm sure if I said go with 315, it's going to look really good every time, right? I mean, I hope like obviously. So we need to generally get up pretty heavy and then try to make those tweaks. And then after that, go back and do like a Q&A where you can ask whatever you want type of thing. Uh, old man saying is you should say everybody lifts weights or light weights well. So, you know, like people. Well, it's funny. This is a yeah. seminar topic, but with Fred, you know what he used to always say? We'd have like the QA after, but whatever reason people wouldn't, it wasn't like they'd always wait till everybody left and think they're going to be the only person with a question. I don't know why they want to act as public. It was never like a bad thing of like, hey, you know, should I take steroids or something? Like, what do you think about it? It was like real, like, hey, when I squat, like, you know, is 
and my back does whatever. It was like real normal questions. And they'd, they'd wait till after it's over, which was fine. So we'd answer. And I was, I was like probably more the question answer because Fred wanted to get out. I just remember he'd always say to me after a while, he'd be like this. He goes, he'd always come over, whisper in my ear, get everybody out of here. It's time for a cold <laughs> beer. <laughs> he'd have like 15 minutes. And then he'd hit, like, it didn't matter, like, where we were. I could be, like, explaining something. He could even be explaining something. But he had, like, this certain threshold stopping point where he wanted a cold beer, as he would say. And he'd always tell me to get everybody out of here. And I just <laughs> abruptly say, guys, we got to be at the – we have a reservation. We got to get out of here right now. See you later. And I have to make something up just to get everybody out of there. Yeah, he probably just reached his uh, max <laughs> – the funniest things he used to say this is the he'd be like this is the first beer i've had in 20 years i'm like fred you say that <laughs> like every month we do a seminar <laughs> uh we used to joke and he's like and then i realized i realized he was joking because he would he's like well i usually drink hard liquor i'm like oh you're not saying it, Frank. You're, <laughs> i get you do we we used to joke at our seminars that like there was this, like the the medicine would start to wear off like I took only a certain amount of medicine and then all of a sudden you get to the point where like the medicine wears off and you're like we got to go yeah like I, like I can't answer any more of these questions uh, I try to answer everybody's but <laughs> I'm in the same boat I mean we would get, you, it's like it's like go, going well, well then it gets like a certain point where like it's going great where like you know you want is this over. Well, the, uh, so when we were kids, uh, and I mean like kids, like when we were in high school, I remember, uh, George used to advertise in all these bodybuilding magazines and powerlifting mm -hmm. USA. Power and USA. I remember that. Yeah. So, uh, we used to like go early, stay late. Cause he just had stacks of them and we would just like go through the magazines and, uh, the one dude who just looked, I mean, if those of you guys like should Google him, if you're listening, the Paul Dillette, like look like Frankenstein. Like if you put bolts in his neck, he was like a fucking, mm -hmm. just a freak. And uh, his deal was he never trained over 60%. So it was just like 60%. Like if he could bench, you know, 100-pound dumbbells, he went with 60. So like everything was 60%, 60%. So I remember asking George, I'm like, can you get really strong off the 60%? And his thing was like, if 60% got us strong, why the fuck would we lift these heavy ones? Do you know how much work it is just to get these plates on and off the fucking bar? And believe me, nobody's going to pay to watch you lift 60%. And I was like, okay, that was fair enough. So like, you know, a lot of dispelling a miss. But then when I started teaching seminars, I used to get these same questions that everybody was trying to find this like backdoor hack into like strength and power that didn't involve lifting these heavy fucking mm. weights. And uh, as you were telling the beginner story, you know, we were in the same deal teaching like we weren't necessarily beginner like we didn't get very many beginners, but on occasion we would get people that were like advanced kettlebell athletes that hadn't trained with barbells. So we get okay. people in and we get like, and, and I, I can pretty much like I can watch somebody set up on a barbell and I can tell you how long they've been training. Like if all of a sudden they like, you know, like basically set the bar up and they kind of center it in the rack and they put their hands and all of a sudden they look from side to side, they get themselves and they pull, you know, you can watch somebody walk up to a barbell mm -hmm. and how they approach it and get underneath like the confidence and just like the repetition just looks automatic. And then you watch them take a step out. They don't mess with their feet. It's one, two, they, they adjust and then they squat, right? Like you can watch somebody and be like, oh, this guy's fucking obviously done this for a long time. Opposed from everybody where they're doing like the Lombada of death where they're taking 25 steps back and then right. walking, you know, like, so all of a sudden this guy's like, uh, you know, look pretty fit. We start getting underneath and like, he gets underneath the bar and I think it was like maybe 135 looked a little dicey 225 and it's just literally like hips back bending him like a taco and uh you know and then it's like hey dude like put it back in like what's going on let's get it right and then it starts arguing with me the efficacy of barbells versus kettlebells and how kettlebells are so much better and I'm like okay um all right well let's do a little test um go pick the heaviest kettlebell that you can and so he goes over and I think it was like the heaviest they had was like 72 two pood. I'm like, okay, show me something that you can do. Show me anything that's like kettlebell unique. And so like, I don't swing kettlebells, but uh, I can swing heavy kettlebells. We got a 203 that I swing. Like I'm like, I can do a lot of kettlebell stuff without doing kettlebells. Okay. Show it to me. I'll do this. Okay, great. And I did everything he asked me to. I'm like, all right, go back. Let's see you squat 225. He couldn't squat 225. I'm like, so here's a good indicator. If I can, if I'm strong enough to do all your stuff, but yet you can't train with these barbells, there's a good indicator that maybe this alone isn't helping you carrying over the same way it has. Like, you know, like. That's a good way to look at it. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, you know, I, I like I was never. Well, formally, even with strongman training, like if you just trained heavy strongman, you're not going to go under and squat 500 pounds probably if you've never done it before. But the strongman training is uh, like 
I, uh, dude, we had a whole day um, when I was in um, when I was in the NFL, like uh, so training with Roth. We had a whole field strong day where it was heavy, hard, and awkward, like to the point where I remember Roth. Mm-hmm. We were doing pull ups, and Raphael just unbolted. We had like a pull up structure. He just unbolted it. So I jumped up to get pull ups, and this thing shaking around, and I'm like, "Holy shit, it's broken!" He's like, "No, I just unbolted it, dude. We're gonna do pull ups today." You guys got too good. I got to find a different way to challenge it, find more awkward ways to do things. So like heavy, hard, and awkward was like the entire recipe of the day. And I ended up um, kind of like the way I think about it is like metal. Um, You know, the way that you make metal really strong is you heat it, you pound it, you fold it, you cool it, you heat it, you pound it, and you got to fold the metal. You know, that's how they make swords, right? Um, so that like that tensile strength improves mm-hmm. every time you heat it and pound it and work it. And so I really look at the strong men training as like building tensile strength that like, there's a certain strength you can develop through the barbells. But like when you start kind of coupling those two and you start doing that field strong and that as you, I'm sure you've seen the same thing too, when you start adding that strong men aspect to it and all of a sudden grip and grooves, isometrics, different positions, you know, like, you know, as uh, as great as it is to pull a bar off the ground. Like you can't pick up a heavy stone or a heavy bag or a 200 pound sandbag with a flat back. You got around, but then all yeah. of a sudden, oh, yeah. I, you know, you pick that up and then you go back and you deadlift and you realize that, all right, you know, I know that here's the position. If I get a little out, it's not going to fucking hurt me. So, um, and the kettlebells became an interesting piece just for the fact that let's find the heaviest ones we could swing and find different circuits for it. And so we do a whole kind of strongman day, um, that I call density training, uh, with my fighters. Mm-hmm. And uh, the amount of dividends that I've seen it play in terms of them, in terms of throws and you know judo stuff, and even in the jits and the push and the pulling has been just like astronomical. Like if they, if, if anybody, the so what's an like what's an example of the density? That sounds interesting. Um, so last week we um, it was uh, max triple uh, overhand on the fat bar deadlift. So we mm-hmm. got two inch fat bar, so they'd go yeah, overhand. Yeah. Um, so I'll go in there and shark them. I think they got up to like 120, 140 kilos. I think I pulled 175 for a triple overhand, which, and if, if I can pull 400 pounds or close to it overhand on a fat bar, like that's fucking legit for me. You're doing okay. Uh, yeah, 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 for sure. You know, I, I got big mitts and I got strong hands. So like I get a really good grip on it. Uh, and then when they fail, we go to, you know, obviously an alternate grip. And then when they pull to the top, they have to max time holds. So we'll do that. Then we'll go over and we'll usually pick out. So I got sandbags that are like, uh, and D balls that are 80, 100, 150, 200, um, you know, different weights. And then I got kettlebells from 72, 100, 150, 203. So we'll basically, uh, you know, it was like Mm -hmm. 10 swings. And then we did um, um, suitcase deadlifts one side and then one arm farmers walk back. So you got to swing 10, 10 right, 10 left, walk back. And so we'll just end up doing trips of that. And then uh, I basically threw that out and then it was swings. And then we'll do, um, we'll basically put all of the uh, the D-balls and the sandbags in a circle and everybody stands one and you basically pick one up and you have to throw it at somebody. Mm-hmm. And you basically just do this kind of crazy round robin game of picking up the sandbag and throwing it. And then eventually everybody just gangs up on one dude and throws everything at him. And then he okay. has to pick them all up and try to get rid of them. We just set clocks and go 20 minutes. We'll do a bunch That's of reverse, cool. a bunch of reverse hypers. Uh, my other favorite is we do prison style push pulls. So we'll get like gi belts, and one guy's on the hammer curl, one guy's on the tricep press down, and they have to do isometric contractions. And we'll do those for like you know two or three minute bouts, and then it ends up just turning into head fighting, where all of a sudden they just bury their heads and try to push each other out, go back. So it's a lot of isometrics, uh, a lot of loaded carries, a lot of heavy swings. Um, try to do everything barefoot if we can. Awesome. Um, you know, we've been fucking a lot, a lot with, uh, the, the WEC boards and the WEC platforms. So the different mm-hmm. angles, which has been pretty fun, but, um, I really like that fat bar for like the deadlifts, like that piece has been really interesting watching and yeah, just basically joke. doing, doing the isometrics at the top, uh, man, your resistance pull-ups. So they go up and pull-ups and have to hold, and then basically I'll grab them by the waist and we do forced isometrics on the pull-ups and different grips. So anything that looks like heavy, hard, and awkward, any way I can add manual resistance, anything that's grip heavy, isometric, weird, and uh, just fucking awful. So, and um, that piece, I mean, opposed from obviously teaching them to lift weights and the training and compensatory acceleration and the plyos and the jumps. I mean, all that stuff is like, you know, other days of the week, but like that, that density day 
Um, they just know it's going to be hard. It's going to be awkward. Well, that, it, it should just be like a fat bar. That's you know who Oda Hagen is. No, he's like um, he was competing in world's strongest like man, and he was like a professional strongman. He's competing into his sixties. He's like seventy something now. He still does grip stuff again the open division, but up until about ten years ago, he's actually competitive in open professional strongman. But he, I trained with him. In 2004 and 2005, we trained together out in California. He lives in Thousand Oaks, Newberry Park, somewhere down there. Mm -hmm. And um, he was huge on those overhand. I mean, he sells grip records now, but like that was a staple of basically our kind of thing was he wanted me to work with him on his bench and his squat. And he would, we, I'd work with him on um, the strongman stuff. And um, that was a lot of what we do. We that like because we'd rotate events a lot, but that that overhand deadlift on an axle bar w- um, w- was something that found its way in there quite often. It seemed. Yeah, that was um, that's a big one for us, um, it, and it always has been. Uh, when we taught the seminars, I used to set up three fifteen uh, on the axle bar, and I just leave it out there. And if you could pull it for a single overhand, I'd give you a free T-shirt. Most people can't because I've had people. Working with the grip strength, people that mid seven hundred deadlifters that will they can't do three fifty and stuff. Yeah. Oh yeah. No. Uh, um, who's that big dude from West Side? Uh, Burley. Um, is it Burley Hawk? Big fucking raw lifter. Um, he's one. Yeah, of I know Yeah, that guy's a fucking beast. Uh, he posted some stuff on the West Side thing, and we were kind of messaging back and forth, just because um, you know, like I like to. Um, at least like, well, we'll, kind of the way the cycle works is like, they'll, they'll do two poles in a week and then a a big pole in the next, like, you know, we got to go a two one. Um, but if they do uh, a trap or a pole, that second pole will always be with the the fat bar just, you know, as a way to kind of, I mean, obviously they're not gonna be able to handle the same load. And then obviously the next week, you know, then it'll be heavy something either off the floor, off of the, the bigger plate. So it's like a rack pole. Or, you know, RDLs or whatever, just some max effort pull. But that uh, he posted something about, uh, you know, obviously pulling the fat bar and that. And I kind of messaged him like, you know, because he's a fucking 800 pound deadlifter. I was like, dude, like, what are you pulling for reps on that? And he's like, oh, I think I can pull like 170 kilos um, for reps. And I was like, shit. I was like, dude, I'm pretty close. But I mean, I can't deadlift 800 pounds. So, uh, but that's, uh, but I also don't focus on the deadlift. Um, I know, you know, when I did, I deadlifted in the sevens, but, uh, I just just got to the point where like chasing a fucking max effort, 800 pound deadlift just didn't seem to be in the cards in terms of like risk versus reward. Yeah. I mean, personally, I like doing strongman events and stuff a lot more myself. Yeah. I mean, uh, um, squatting heavy didn't bother me, but I felt like pulling heavy just fucking took it took years off my life. (laughs) I don't know why that is. So a lot of CNS strains for sure. Yeah. So what, uh, like, so what's the day to day now? Are you still training athletes? I mean, I know you've, you know, part again? you got pro. Um, so what's your day to day look like now? Are you still training athletes? I know you do, you know, you write books, you got programs, you know, different things you do, but are you still um, so t- mostly online right now. I was basically doing for years, 12, 13 hours a day at Metroflex, but I'm primarily online now and I'll have people mostly come in here and stuff to train every so often. So I'm still in the gym, but not like, you know, I'm meeting the same person at Wednesday at 9 a.m. type of stuff. Mm-hmm. So a lot of stuff online. Um, and then, yeah, basically writing, creating programs, things like that, and then, and then servicing programs. So I've been pretty busy. Yeah, that's good. I mean, uh, is, is Metroflex still as uh, much of a kind of spectacle as it was from those Ronnie Coleman days? Yeah, for sure. It's It's not. That's pretty cool about it. It hasn't really changed. It's not like they're trying to like, you know, upgrade it to the new and improved Metroflex where it like totally bastardizes the identity. It's it's the same as it ever was, for sure. Uh, Mike Rashid, who who I know actually is crazy. I met Rashid through he came to one of my seminars when he was okay. doing like some figure bodybuilding stuff. And, you know, and then he since taked off. But I know they started uh, kind of a Metroflex out in Long Beach. We went out there a few times and that place was like like spray painted walls, graffiti, the whole deal was pretty wild. I think it was him and uh I- CJ Fletcher. Was I haven't been to that one yet, but pe- people like that one, right? Yeah. It was, uh, um, had a, uh, an interesting kind of hardcore, um, like prison vibe. If they gave them spray paint, it was kind of the way I got it. Like the music was loud, a lot of fucking 
cobwebs in the corner, like, you know, a bunch of, you know, weights that jangle. It was good. I, I, I appreciate it. Oh, I thought good it good was more, I, I didn't realize it was like that. I thought it was a little, I thought that was one of the nicer ones. Okay. Well, I, I've never been to your Metroflex. So based on the pictures, it might be nice. <laughs> have you been to the one in Austin yet? No, they, they have one. Metroflex Austin. Yeah. It's more North Austin though, like kind of around. It's kind of by the Salt Lake that all all you can eat barbecue in that general area, like Round Rock kind of. It's not really by you, I don't think. I mean, it'd be a little bit of a hike, but it's there's, good. They have there's a uh, uh, yeah. Um, I haven't. I'm um, fuck, dude. I'm I'm awful about uh, traveling, just because I I have my gym and uh, but I should go out and do more. But I I know that the big text gym is up there. Um, and then I, I've been out to the collective. I don't know Big Tex and Metroflex, oddly enough, are within, um, I bet you they're within a seven, eight minute drive. They're really close. Oh, shit. Um, I do jits up there, up off of up kind of North Austin. So Six Blades is up there. Okay. Cause I've done two seminars at both their gyms, I think, or three at both their gyms have been, and they're really close to each other. And a lot of the same people kind of train at both. They go back and forth. They have like different equipment and everybody kind of goes like for something on one day and something for the other. Yeah. Well, I think big techs, there's some air conditioning and <laughs> it, not the whole gym, but there is air conditioning in there. Yeah. I would say their equipment is better. Like of like, if you want, like you're going to train for a meet, you want the right bar that you know is not going to be bent and stuff. It's probably a little bit better. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, the, the Metro flex Austin was good. They used to have, I think it's kind of died down, but like about seven to 10 years ago, they had, um, they'd have a bunch of powerlifters training on Sundays. I mean, they would have like, I'd have certain people I'm working with online go in there and like, say they're doing like compensatory acceleration set squats. So the rest like three minutes between sets or whatever mm -hmm. they they're so their workout would take eight, nine hours because <laughs> there were so many freaking people in there. It was like, a, it was ridiculous. Dude, you're right. It's uh, fuck. I did. It's in Pflugerville. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know there was a Metroflex here. It looks like a big warehouse. With the other good man. gym out there is further out in Georgetown. Have you been to House of Gains or heard of that? Uh, I have not. Um, I've heard of it. I've never been there. House of Gains. Huh? Yeah. Oh yeah. That one is a weaker atmosphere. Well, at least when I've been there, it's more of like a. It, it's it's really well equipped and it's huge, but it's like. If you were like feeling like shit and you had to deadlift heavy and like needed to get a pick me up, it would not be the place to go. But if you're like, hey, I got a bodybuilding workout and I want to hit my pec from 50 angles, it'd be the place to go. <laughs> like, like every single one, it's like the yeah, decline. Every single thing you could think of, you could do. <laughs> or the ones that have like eight yeah. thousand. Uh, the the one. Um, I was tempted to buy it because I don't want to have to actually go to a gym to use one, but I've been watching, uh, all these people do like, um, like the machine glute bridge, like the wet, like, um, hammer strength has got like, they strap them in and they're doing like, like the glute bridges, you know, like a uh, fucking Brett booty yeah. contrast. Uh, so we'll, I, I've been using uh, a bunch of glute bridges with the fighters just because it's a, it's a good position on the bottom for the wrestlers and the grapplers, especially like their glutes right. to be able to bridge up. So we've been using it more. And so, um, we found some creative ways to do it. And I was like looking at like videos of like people using the machines and I was like, shit, I should just buy one of those. I'm like, ah, but I'd like to go use a couple different ones just cause everything's set up different. Like, I'm sure, you know, yeah. like, um, like for me, uh, the only leg press I've ever liked is, uh, that hammer strength kind of seated isolateral one where you're kind of seated this way and you can do one leg at a time, Yeah, yeah. Like hook up a bunch of band tension. So I have that one. And then I also like the, uh, hammer iso incline which i think is like that accessory movement was probably one of my best accessory movements only machine one i liked to help me build my bench so it was like close grip you inclines? That. yeah yeah that seated yeah. in I, iso incline yeah, i, like I love oh shit you can pack plates on that thing yeah it's a great it, machine it, you can play with the different handles and the seat heights and hit different parts like that's I, I and i have one of those so, uh, but over the years you train at different gyms and like there comes to be certain pieces of equipment that you use that for some reason that that piece seems to be a driver better than other ones. And I mean, how I've much are those glute bridge machines? What, what, what do they cost? Um, I don't know. Like I saw one for like 1900 and I saw the fucking hammer strength one for like 5,000. So like, you know, I mean, it's a serious, it's a big piece of equipment too. And it's a fucking good yeah. investment. So like, it's not something I and was Is your just, gym at your house? Is your gym on your property or is it somewhere else? Yeah, no, no, it's on our property. 
So when I left California, I was uh, obviously lived in a house cool. and then where I was renting Power Athlete and then I had the shop where I weld and fab and was building trucks next door to Power Athlete. And so I'm spending 15 grand a month in leases and I'm trying to buy a building. Uh, this was another reason to move. So I found right. a little, like a dope little uh, warehouse in Costa Mesa I was going to purchase and like move everything over there. And so we, you know, start talking to the guy, he's got it up. And all of a sudden some dude drops like $3 million in cash on his doorstep. And is like, you know, cause they were basically buying the little warehouses and turning them into grows for marijuana. And every one of those places got picked up as a grow. Oh. So I, I couldn't buy a warehouse like in orange County that wasn't like some dude wasn't coming in with cash to buy us a grow. So that was kind of like a deal. I was just pissed off at paying lease and I couldn't buy anything. So when we came out to Texas, my first thing was like, I'm not leasing from anybody. So we poured a big slab. I built a big building. I built my own gym and basically everything's on the property and it's behind a gate. And it's, uh, you know, the thing that I hated about owning a gym when I had a gym in, uh, Costa Mesa, Newport beach, I would come in and shit would be broken. And I'd be like, how the fuck do you break a comp bench? Or somebody would like, you know, like pop the pop bearings out of the bar or like yeah, we had, yeah. um, we, we were doing a whole bunch of dynamic stuff. So we, we got a Tendo. You're going to laugh at this. We bought a Tendo and we were like testing, you know, a bunch of compensatory acceleration and how fast people were, you know, bar speed and this, and I got all geeked out. So I started using some bands to see if we could like replicate it. So I had, you know, all these fucking elaborate bands wrapped around the monolift and, you know, everything was numbered and we had basically found different heights and put them on weights. And so I knew exactly what band was at each weight and I had all this math equation, had it basically sitting there so we could be pretty exact. And I came in one day and, uh, some, you know, um, the class had gone and they, the, one of the coaches and wanted to use bands for stretching. So the fucking people just came and took all the bands off of my mono and I came in and all the bands were gone. I was like, what the fuck happened to all the bands? And they're like, oh, well, we needed them for the class. So I just had the, the, uh, the, uh, um, the members just take them. They just grabbed them off of the mono. And I was like, that day I went and I rented a Damn, little, I, I went and rented a little warehouse for power athlete and basically moved all of my shit in there. And like, at that point I was like, I want a gym. I just don't want members. Like, I don't want people to like, I have nice equipment. I don't want to fucking yeah. have to come in and fix shit because people don't take care of your stuff. So that was the day I got out of the gym business and I was like, I want my own training place. I want my own equipment and I want to keep it nice. So when I built my place, um, you know, it's not open to the public. It's invite only. Um, there's no fees cause there's, or there's no payment cause I don't want any entitlement. So if you come train, it's by invitation only and you know, everything has to stay clean and nice and I buy good equipment and I, and I use it every day. That's awesome. Yeah. So it's been, I, I, I love having my own gym. Especially it's at the top of the hill, so I gotta like walk up it and every day I walk up, I'm like make it another day. So but it's uh it, it's been nice to have my own gym. Um, you know, but uh I think um, you know, if you have a location like that Metroflex with that, I mean that's also all next to impossible to be able to replace that level of intensity and have those individuals. Sure. And and I think the that's like the one element that um doesn't get talked about enough, like the environment in which you train. Like I firmly think strength like exists in osmosis. If you're like, you're around strong people, you will get stronger. Uh, like if you're the strongest dude in the gym, go find another gym or find new training partners, you know? Yeah. I think there's something, definitely something to like it. Basically. Um, I, I think you're right. Good company is the best, but I always say that no company is better than bad company for sure too. So <laughs> being around, you know, a weak, weak environment's the worst. Yeah. How, uh, how do you deal with that? You just run people out. Or they do the, you know, when you're training and you see people like that, do they just not gravitate towards a place like Metroflex? I think that's the key is they just don't gravitate to, toward, toward me. Yeah, it's just not even, a, it's not even like a, it's not even like a, a, I guess it's not a common enough problem to even give it a much thought. It doesn't really happen. So uh, our mutual friend, Zach Evan Esch, uh, will yeah. constantly ask me, he asked me the other day, he's like, hey, do you have air conditioning in your building? And I was like, no, we just have like a big ass fan, just pushes hot air. It's like getting hit with a hairdryer. He's like, I don't have air conditioning and these kids don't like it. It's not, you know, this. And he, so he was complaining that kids today are soft because they don't want to train in that hot an environment. And I'm like, well, I mean, it's, it's an interesting point. Like I, you know, I, and he's like, when you were a kid, I'm like, ah, I don't know, man. Like I'm, I'm so past trying to relate this present generation to how we grew up because uh like there's nothing's the same like the fact that my kids can go to a tv they can turn on and there's like a netflix or whatever else these streaming channels 
and there's mm-hmm. TV on 24 hours a day of like endless amounts of shows. Uh, you know, I tell the kids, watch. yeah, I remember turning on the TV and like we turned it on and there was literally like the news and fucking mash was about it. And we just turned it off and go outside because there yeah, was mash. never like, like it was like mash chips and like a few other things like price is right. Like it was nothing exciting to watch. It wasn't like movies or this. And we just like turned it off. Like we didn't really watch TV. Like, and I like people bitch about it, but I'm like, dude, if, if there was this level of TV and this much shit, we probably would have been glued to it as well. Like oh, computer yeah, games. Sure. Yeah. So like people like, oh, this, so like the different time. I'm like, dude, I'm just saying that like, if I had a device that I could carry around that had like TV and Netflix and fucking shit on it, like I probably would have been stuck on that thing too. You know, we didn't, we had to ride bikes and do all the other crazy shit we did. Cause there wasn't that opportunity. Like going to the beach was our deal. But to say that like, oh, I wouldn't have done it. I probably would have been right there with you guys. It's like, uh, um, Uber eats and all, um, like, uh, the food that gets delivered. Um, I've never yeah. ordered food. In, like I'm just like, I go to the market, I cook food and I eat. Um, and then Matt Vinson was like, oh, there's a place that sends cookies 24 hours a day. You can get like two dozen warm cookies sent to your house. And I'm like, you do you order those? He's like, yeah, all the time. I was like, wait a minute. So I got on and there's like, you can yeah. order from all these ads and they just send it to your house. And I'm like, he's like, why would you waste time to go get it? I'm like, like, doesn't there have to be like, don't I have to go out and get it to bring it home to actually earn it a little bit? I just can't sit there and bring me food like that. So I think it's just a difference in philosophies or mindset, but I, I still like to go to the grocery store. Where my wife's like, why don't you just get it delivered? I'm like, because I like to walk around and see shit. Yeah, no, I'm the same way. Yeah. Yeah. So do you, do you ever get down in this part of the town? No, let's, I'll, I'll definitely um, drop you a line if I do get down there, though. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll, I'll shoot you my number, man. And uh, yeah, it'd be yeah. great to connect if you want to go out and we'll go, to, uh, go out and eat something, barbecue, or go drink some beers or whatever, or even lift some weights. Love it. down. Yeah, it'd be good to finally connect. So Cool. Let me know if you're up here, too. Yeah, for sure. Well, uh, dude, that was sure. solid, man. I, uh, it was two hours. <laughs> I appreciate it. I was about to tell you, I got to get off at what, 12, so we're perfect. Yeah, no, it works. But uh, people want to get a hold of you. Obviously, we talked about uh, Jailhouse Strong and any any other um, social channels. or On on Instagram, then Josh Strength on Twitter. And I got my website, joshstrength.com. Cool. All right, we'll put those in the show notes. And so uh, if you guys want to get a hold of them, you can get a hold of them. Sounds like an easy man, busy man. But uh, thanks for tuning in another episode of Power Athlete Radio.